Good afternoon, everyone, to those joining us today on Zoom and everyone tuning via Facebook. Hope you are all doing well. I am Danica Marie Supnet. And I'm Francis Joseph de la Cruz. And we'll be moderating today's session on uh, climate change and COVID-19, uh, adapting to new normals. This is uh, our second session, Diva Danica. Yes. So this three-part webinar series is organized by the Embassy of the Netherlands and the Philippines and the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities as part of the Global Climate Adaptation Summit, which was formally launched last January 25. For this webinar series, uh, we will be highlighting key actors, mechanisms, and experiences around narratives on local climate action planning, the role of science and emerging research for resilience building, and climate finance and policy for upscaling climate action and cooperation as build up leading to the 26th Conference of Parties. So in our previous episode, we listened to the stories of our local government partners from Coron, Palawan, Mandawe City, share their experience in addressing both climate change impacts in their community. Today, we'll be moving into or we'll be discussing the emerging researches and science. Uh, we will be joined by a panel of climate, economic, and development experts to tackle the importance of science research, evidence-based policy development that would address the twin crisis of the climate and the, the other crisis, the pandemic, that has compounded all our other uh, problems. Our webinar will try to address the following. Um, what are the gaps, the challenges, and opportunities in climate research that is crucial to our planning process for development with the climate lens? We'll also discuss how the climate science research community can better support the development planning process. No? So we, we'll have uh, all these discussions. We have a distinguished panel of uh, experts. So please uh, you know, stay tuned. Before we get started, we have a few reminders for our guests and viewers. For those joining us via Zoom, please change your screen name to name underscore your organization or office. This is for us to help um, identify you better throughout the session. You can do so by finding your name in the participant list, pressing the more button and selecting rename. For documentation purposes, we will be recording this webinar. Also, our organizers will be keeping everyone on mute during the sessions to make sure our speakers are heard loud and clear by all viewers. <laughs> Kindly avoid unmuting yourself unless called upon during the open forum. For questions and your comments, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. The live stream through the ICSC page or the, or the, or the live stream via the Embassy of the Netherlands and the Philippines um, please feel free to send your comments and insights through the comment section. Our team will be happy to monitor our series. You may visit the following platforms, bit.ly slash cast21 COVID, uh, climate COVID-19. And fp.com slash nl in Philippines via Twitter at icsc.ngo and at nl in Philippines and via LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash company slash ICSC dash page. You may know more about the Climate Adaptation Summit by also visiting um, www.cas2021.com and also the following social media platforms. Francis? All right, um, well, let, let's uh, introduce our distinguished panel of experts. Uh, and I hope they'll be on screen pretty soon. Let, let me just, uh, you know, read their, uh, I'll introduce them to you. We'll, they'll be talking about uh, 
the research has been done at the macro and sectoral uh, level on climate change, and um, later on discussing it in the context, uh, you know, how we are able to bake that into our development planning in the Philippine context. Uh, we'll, we'll hear insights, uh, you know, identify some challenges, and maybe raise some questions on uh, how can we make uh, how can we make this work better, research and policy development. And to help us with that, we have uh, the following guests, uh, and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have Dr. Faye Cruz, uh, uh, a climate scientist and the head of the Regional Climate Systems Laboratory. Uh, in the Manila Observatory, uh, Manila Observatory. She joined the MO in 2009 and her research interests include regional climate and climate change, extreme weather events, and interactions between land surface and climate and the production of high resolution climate change info for the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Dr. Cruz is also part of the Southeast Asia Regional Climate uh, Downscaling uh, experiment uh, or CORDEX uh, under the CORDEX World Climate Research Program. Also joining us today, uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Filino Lansigan. Uh, Dr. Lansigan uh, is a professor emeritus at the University of the Philippines Los Baños and former dean of the UPLB College of Arts and Sciences from 2014 to 2020. He's also a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Climate Change Commission from 2013 up to the present. He's also the project leader of the DOST PICARD, uh, Department of Science and Technology. This is the Philippine Council on uh, Agricultural Research and Development and the UPLB Program on Smarter Agriculture to Invigorate Agriculture as an Industry in the Philippines or Sarai. Uh, so welcome Dr. Lansigan. We also have Dr. Laura David, a uh, physical uh, oceanographer, a professor and director of the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute. Like Dr. Lansigan, she's a member of the NPTE of the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines, and her research interests include coastal oceanography, remote sensing of coastal and the marine environment, ocean energy, coastal ecosystems, climate change, adaptation, and DRRN, and of course, science communication on biodiversity, interconnectivity, and climate resilience. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Toby Melissa Monsob, Associate Professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. She's the former coordinator of the Philippine Human Deve Development Network, or HDN, a nonstop nonprofit organization that comprises about 150 development practitioners whose members come from government agencies, international organizations, civil society organizations, and research institutions. Her research interests in, uh, are regional economics, housing economics, public economics, development economics, and impact evaluation. Her latest research, Rethinking Economic Fundamentals in an Era of Global Physical Shocks, Insights from the Philippine Experience with COVID-19, and Examining What Are the Economic Fundamentals in an Era of global physical shocks such as the pandemic and climate change. Um, welcome to our uh, panel of experts. Uh, po kayo? Uh, okay, let, let me just ask. Uh, uh, well, yeah, good afternoon. Um, uh, some for some of you, well, I know I met Dr. Faye last year at around the same time yes. when we were in a meeting in the coastal cities at risk, uh, I think it was, it was a launching of the capstone projects of the of students of the Ateneo. And it's been a year since we actually touched base. For Dr. Lansigan, it was even longer. Mas uh, matagal pa kaming nakita. Uh, Toby, we had some, uh, you know, conversations or chats, but uh, yeah, it's really, and, and I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Dr. David, but I, I, I'm really curious. Um, how did you cope with the pandemic? Uh, how, 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 you know, what were you doing uh, in the last year? Now, very quickly, how did you, I don't know, uh, uh, what were, what were your, some of your coping mechanisms or your secrets to surviving this pandemic? Dr. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so 
it, it's hard to believe it's just been one year ago pa ang tagal-tagal. <laughs> um, but yeah, it has been challenging, but we, you know, we have tried to find ways to adapt. And so um, thankful to have uh, online communication means like this. And, you know, so it, it, it really helped with, you know, still continuing the projects that we are doing. Because as you know, even with the pandemic, uh, the issues that we have or that we're facing with climate change, it's still there. So yeah, to live for it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Faye. Uh, Dr. Ino, kayo po. how did you, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you're somewhere in Los Baños. So maybe you had a better experience than us, you know, We're stuck in the cities. Well, uh, I, I was teaching for online for uh, two courses, and it was really difficult on my part as well, uh, considering you know uh, internet connectivity. But then uh, you just have to follow the protocols uh, as far as uh, you know the health protocols, and it's really scary because I experienced being exposed to two positives uh, in my community and. It, The anxiety there is really uh, very significant and also uh, scary uh, on our part. But yeah, we survived. We survived. <laughs> we survived. Thank uh, you, Dr. Laura, if you're able to share. Uh, well, aside from adjusting to online lahat, uh, transactions, admi- administrative work, and also classes, Um, in between, I would try, I think I've tried three different new things. Um, so I, I learned how to throw knives. I, um, I started uh, crocheting, which I've never done. And um, now I'm building a backyard deck uh, from scratch in my backyard. Wow. Wow, very interesting. Very interesting combination. Throwing knives and crochet. So I, I'm imagining your knives to have some crochet on, on the handles. <laughs> Iko, uh, Dr. B, how did you cope? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know how to throw knives. <laughs> yes. Now I can throw six feet. I think that's something we need in UP, right? And then we have to start throwing <laughs> knives. <laughs> yeah. Now me, I've, I've just been, gosh, I've never been cooped up, obviously, as, as, as everyone else, as long as this. And, um, and it's, it's really been difficult, um, both in terms of uh, uh, teaching and, and anything, and any sort of productive um, activity. I'm a, I, know, I, I need to go, I need to move, I need to go out and all that. So, How have I survived? I'm not sure I've survived. Honestly, I don't think I'm better off than, <laughs> than in the beginning of 2020. Um, uh, but, you know, things like, well, I'm not sure. Eh? Cooking? I don't know. Stuff like that. We'll see. Uh, certainly, yeah. I didn't think about throwing knives, but that's an idea <laughs> for this year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, our panel of experts, uh, You know, I mean, they can talk about their research, uh, climate science, uh, sectoral researches, development uh, economics. They can also share tips on throwing knives and crochet and <laughs> cook it. <laughs> But anyway, well, welcome and thank you. Uh, this, this is a new medium for all of us. And if you're feeling a bit nervous, it's okay. Uh, Katulad niyo, I'm also a digital native, so you can only imagine how uh, nervous I get sometimes when I have to, you know, to facilitate a uh, an online gathering like this. But uh, well, thank you for making time. So direction na po tayo dun sa ating usapan. Um, I guess my first question would go to Dr. Fay. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about what is the state? Sabi nyo, sabi nyo nga, no? uh, ay, two questions. Sabi nyo kanina, COVID uh, uh, stopped a lot of things for us, but not the climate crisis. And so we need to continue our research. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about the state of you know, climate research, what data do we have, uh, etc. But before that, I would like to pick on something that I mentioned when I was introducing you. You're involved in downscaling mm-hmm. uh, 
research. Can you tell us a little bit more? Kasi po, naisip namin na downscaling, ibig sabihin ba nun, mas bababaan natin yung level? But I think it's it's not that. <laughs> yes. So, um, well, when we talk of um, climate downscaling uh, in our research, um, this this addresses the need to have higher resolution climate information or climate projections. So um, the current, you know, what the climate projections that we get are mainly from global climate models. And um, these models are like um, computer programs that solve these math equations describing the Earth's physics and dynamics. Yeah, so um, it takes a long time to, to run these models and so, um, and since their coverage is global, the trade-off is that they have a low spatial resolution. They tend to have that, and so which can be a bit problematic for the Philippines because we have many islands, and so um, in these global models, um, the islands might just disappear. You know, it's not there, and so that's why we need to do this um, exercise of downscaling, um, which you can do um, via statistical methods. But what we do is um, what we call dynamical downscaling, which means that we have another set of regional climate models that we use um, and to create to have these um, higher resolution projections. So, hindi ibig sabihin, binababahan natin uh, yung res level ng research. Actually, we are increasing the you know, resolution, yes. uh, zooming, yung, in. Yeah. zooming in, and then, you know, yung, yung contrast so that we can find the, yung mas mga maliliit na, uh, sabi, yung projections, no? Uh, tama nga naman, kasi some of our islands are too small. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them actually are the ones that are facing uh, big challenges uh, in terms of climate. I'm, I'm thinking of, say, Eastern Visayas. And you know the islands uh, of Giwan, mm -hmm. na uh, tinatamaan ng ano? Uh, I mean, it's it's within the that corridor ng Yolanda na yeah. tinamaan ng husto. So well, Dr. Fay, um, <clears throat> well aside from the MO, the Manila Observatory, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are we, we have we do have uh, research institutions, no? Sino po ba yung dapat nating ano? I mean. Kuminsan kasi, especially this age of, you know, uh, yung technology, na ang daming information eh. But, but sometimes you just get, uh, you know, you get confused. Uh, um, I remember uh, even during Ondoy, and even yung last typhoon, uh, people were talking about uh, a dam in Rizal, the Wawa Dam, opening its gates. Tapos kumakalat yun. But then I had to tell people, actually I've been to that dam. Wala namang gate yun. So just, <laughs> pero yun nga eh, because information can travel so fast. Kung isang hindi mo alam, saan ka bagwa? Saan, saan mo ba yung, saan ba tayo, uh, which sources of information should we bank on or rely on uh, for climate data? Well, um, yeah, that's an uh, interesting question. So, you know, we we have observation data on the ground, you know, from weather stations, um, from satellites, from climate models that, and these are data that's very useful for infra um, climate research and we can get that um, from Pagasa. Um, for example, they have the climate uh, information um, risk analysis matrix, so that's the CLIRAM. And um, we can also get, uh, in terms of the climate projections, um, we can also access uh, output from uh, data from the Southeast Asia Regional Climate Change Information System. So that's SARCSIS. Um, and Mandela Observatory is, um, has contributed to that uh, data set um, because we have also did our climate projections under the Cordex Southeast Asia project. Um, so yes, uh, it's, uh, these are, there's a lot of uh, data available online. And so what we recommend though is that it's important that there's also uh, expert guidance so that to ensure that the climate data is tailor fit to the user's needs and so um yeah, that, yeah there's because you know there's uh, there's also a need that's one of the the challenges that um there can be a scale mismatch so like for example 
uh, the, the end user will need this particular barangay level um, information, but what is available is just uh, at the provincial scale. So there needs to be some uh, communication between the, the scientists and the end users um, so that we can uh, make sure that the data that they will be using is um, appropriate to what they need. So, okay, so we have this body of knowledge na tinitingnan a global, then there's national, uh, regional, Southeast Asia, then there's national, tapos meron pang pinapaliit, no? Uh, and you're saying kailangan may matching, no? Yung scale, and there is some expert advice. Uh, well, I, I'm just wondering, uh, well, una, sa akin, ang curiosity ko, uh, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, people like me, yung mga nan non-specialists or non-experts can actually help uh, you know at least direct people where they can get information but I'm also thinking of how much of that uh, research is being taken on board by uh, our leaders who are supposed to be doing the planning no? uh, ano po yung experience nyo? Uh, so uh, for Manila Observatory um, and also for Cordex Southeast Asia we're now um, recognizing the importance of adopting a transdisciplinary research in our project, a trans transdisciplinary approach in our research projects. And that just means that there is more um, active engagement between the scientists and the end users um, so that we can co produce the climate change information. So, um, an example project would be this uh, collaboration between Manila Observatory, um, Ateneo, and um, Pag-asa, um, and it's funded by DOSD Pichard, wherein we uh, consolidated the climate projections that we have so that we can have like a, 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 a bigger set of and a wider range of plausible future changes in climate extremes that, um, that can be used for planning. And in the creation of um, this data set, um, we had um, some consultations with uh, local government units, with national agencies, um, to make sure that the data that we are creating is understandable and usable. And so this led to the creation of this uh, soon to be launched Philippine Climate Extremes Report 2020. And that contains all of the projected changes in temperature and rainfall extremes, um, which also introduces this um, so we have the CLIRAM tool, and now we're introducing a CERAM tool, which is the Climate Extremes Risk Analysis, a risk assessment matrix that the LGUs can use for their development planning. And uh, we also are preparing um, this online uh, learning modules to accompany and support uh, the use of the, the report and the, the CERAM tool. Um, we also have another project, which you mentioned uh, at the start of uh, this uh, this um, session, the CCARPH project, the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines project. And this is um, a collaboration of uh, Manila Observatory, Ateneo, Ateneo Innovation Center, and uh, the National Resilience Council with support from IDRC Canada. And in this project, we work together with LGUs, particularly with uh, Iloilo City and Naga City, um, to help build their capacity for understanding and using climate information and so that it helps so that it is effectively mainstreamed into their development planning so yes yeah i just want to you know give some time for our uh, viewers to see it on uh, sharing a screen so what you're telling us is that i mean we, we don't have a shortage of uh climate data i mean we have we're, we're pretty, uh, you know, we, we have this healthy, uh, a big body of uh, uh, data. But what is needed is that this data is tailor, tailored to the needs of the users. And for that, we, we need the access, which is, again, a, a challenge. Because without COVID, I think... Uh, uh, Ano lang tayo eh, pupunta lang tayo dun sa mga lugar na yun. But with COVID, medyo we're forced to go online, which has its own set of challenges. No? Buti na lang, hindi pa tayo nagkakaroon ng technical uh, glitch. But I, I won't be surprised if some of our speakers drop off because it's ju it just comes with online 
uh, technology. But that's that's really um, really interesting. Um, do you have uh, some more uh, information that you can share about uh, what what are some of the observed and future climate, you know, projections? Meron ba tayong meron ba tayong available na uh, kanya? Just just I, I know this is a big body of knowledge, and we just want to make sure that in this uh, webinar, uh, people are made aware that we have information that can be tapped, we have institutions that can be called upon, so that we will have plans that are evidenced. You, know? you have a scientific backup for your, for your plans. Uh, I think we have a slide, and maybe you can uh, uh, walk us through that slide. Okay. So, um, okay, let's just see. So, yeah, so, um, so in this series of slides, um, I just um, uh, collated uh, some of the information on the future changes in climate that uh, we, are, we are now seeing. Um, and so uh, for in terms of the uh, warming in the Philippines, uh, the observation records show that there is an average rate of about 0.1 degrees Celsius um, per decade warming. And that if we were to compare the daytime and the nighttime temperatures, it's the nighttime temperatures that are actually warming at a slightly higher rate at 0.15 degrees Celsius per decade. And what the projections show is that um, this will continue to increase into the future. And it could be ranging from um, 0.9 to 2.3 degrees by the 21st century and from 1.3 to 4.1 degrees Celsius at the end of the 21st century. And um, in terms of rainfall, the observed trends that we are seeing is that um, it's different from place to place and from season to season as shown in the maps. Um, so here we could see that uh, some areas in Western Luzon have increasing trends. So meaning that it's uh, becoming wetter, uh, but uh, and it's mainly before and after the rainy season uh, of June to August. And we also see this increasing trends in Eastern Visayas and Northeast Mindanao during the rainy season from December to February. So um, they can, so it has been that they have been receiving a lot more rainfall during the rainy season. But there are also drying trends that we could see from Palawan to um, northern Mindanao and mainly in the months of March to August. So in terms of projections, we see, again, it's, it's, not, it's very variable. It's not like with, with temperature that we could see uniform increases, uniform warming everywhere. But here, um, some places will have like a drier future, some are wetter. Um, although they did note uh, in the Pag-asa report, they did note that there is a a drier tendency over central Mindanao. Um, and in the recent set of analysis that we did with um, Manila Observatory, Ateneo, and Pag-asa, we find that in terms of rainfall extremes, um, that we would see a general drying trend annual rainfall. And what I mean by that is that the total rainfall that we receive for every year can be lower, but this doesn't mean that you know we don't we won't be experiencing extreme rainfall days you know so it can still happen um, and in terms of the tropical cyclones um, we find that there is a small decrease in the number of tropical cyclones over the Philippine area of responsibility and there has been um, a small increase in the strong very strong typhoons and this can still you know happen in the future but with as with with rainfall, it's hard to, to project really the changes in tropical cyclones because it changes every year. So, but, but that just gives us an idea of, you know, what we're experiencing now, it, we, we need to prepare because we are in the future that could still be something that can happen. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Faye Cruz. Uh, well, well, para sa atin, uh, I should have uh, paid more attention to maybe my science teacher and also took the weather forecast more weather forecasts more seriously to understand it. Kasi yung sinasabi nyo, uh, parang sa isip ko, okay, there will be drier months, but that doesn't mean you are not, we're not getting, uh, you know, increased rainfalls. 
hindi ibig sabihin nun walang bagyo, kukunti ang bagyo pero baka lumakas. And, and, and I think that's, you know, that's something that we really need to take on uh, in our development planning, whether at the national or at the local level. So, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, hindi natin kaya exhaust yung ano eh, yung yung climate information na kaya yung irelay but uh, it's just to inform our uh, our uh, participants here that if you need data like for sure there is data there is research at that level uh, and uh, you know we can we can uh, we actually need to use this and tailor fit this uh, data so that we can use it for our planning so Thank you, ma'am. And we'll move to, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Faye Cruz. We'll now move to the sectors. Now, after being given the, you know, an overview of what climate, uh, uh, climate research or climate information we have, we're moving to uh, like the sectors. Uh, so we're moving to Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Lansigan, uh, Dr. Ino. Yeah. Ano po ba ang inyong ano? Uh, I mean, you are in the. I mean, you're looking at climate, but how it affects agriculture primarily, ni po ba? That's Maybe right. you can tell us a little bit more about uh, the research that uh, you are involved in. That's right, Francis. Uh, climate change affects agriculture, and agriculture, by the way, is also affecting climate change in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. So it has been established by the scientific community uh, locally and also abroad in the international community the different climate change impacts on agriculture like crops, livestock, poultry. Uh, and these are known, for example, I'll give you an example. Climate change reduces crop yields of rice by about 10 to 14% for every one degree increase in temperature. So you could just imagine uh, the loss of another 10 to 14 percent. And this will add, well, uh, if you recall, uh, the Philippines is importing 10 percent of our rice uh, requirement. Okay, so this will be an additional uh, factor to consider. Uh, climate change also reduced the winning rate in hogs, in poultry, by about 20 percent. So may namamatay na isa sa bawat lima. Okay. And again, that's another problem that we're encountering now uh, that will also threaten food security. And uh, as far as poultry is concerned, there is increased mortality rate in poultry by about 18 to 22%. Uh, why? Because of the increased temperature. So uh, that's another issue. And uh, the latest estimates of losses and damages due to climate-related hazards, which I happen to glimpse, uh, glimpse on, is from the PIDS report, is 133.2 billion pesos per year. Wow. Uh, annual uh, average losses due to climate-related hazards like typhoons. So uh, these factors, if you consider, uh, will actually be threatening sustainable development of our country and in particular food security. So we really need to address this particular issue. Yeah, nabanggit niyo Sir Ino, yung uh, there's an impact on the uh, weaning of hogs. Diba? Kasi yeah, pag yeah. iniisip ko lang yun, in the last, well, previous to COVID, uh, halimbawa may impact na nga yung climate sa Winning of hugs, tapos tinamaan pa tayo ng ASF. <laughs> Pag tayo sa ASF, tinamaan pa ng COVID. Tapos ngayon, ano, sabi nga nila, ano, eh, uh, uh, talagang very dear ang, ano, ang mga baboy ngayon. Napakamahal kasi <laughs> ng baboy. So I was just, yeah, it, it was just something that struck me na talagang uh, it, it is a real concern. Sabihin, it is a concern with regards to climate change. Plus, there can be other compounding uh, factors like yung, yung mga ganyan, ASF, yung African swine flu. Tapos no, yung yung iba, sabi nung mga magbababoy, hindi pa sila nakaka-recover sa ASF. Nag-COVID naman. So restricted na naman yung kanilang uh, market. So hindi sila nag-produce talaga ng uh, baboy. 
hindi gumagal, nagre-recover pa lang sa ESF, nagre-recover pa ulit sila sa COVID restrictions. Kaya siguro tayo nagkakaganto. Pero bakit, um, pero, uh, how do we address this? How can we uh, uh, manage the risks in agriculture so that we can prepare? Uh, katulad po na nabanggit ni Dr. Fay Cruz, there might be extreme uh, weather events. Uh, mas iinit o sa ibang lugar, uh, Tapos, and bro, pinanggit niya yung Mindanao. And I think we, we have a lot of, uh, I mean, agricultural production happening in those those areas. How do we, what, what can be done so that we can adapt to this uh, uh, impacts of climate change? Okay, uh, we need to research on this uh, climate change adaptation to address this issue of uh, losses and damages on our agricultural sector. And uh, one of this particular adaptation measure is providing measures to manage climate risk in terms of uh, insurance. Um, we already have uh, traditional risk management strategies in the past. Uh, this is very popular in uh, Southern Tagalog region, for example, on the Pacquiao or Paiwe or Ariendo system. Okay, those are examples of uh, risk transfer or risk sharing mechanisms or arrangement. Okay. In other words, the idea is you share or transfer the risk to somebody else or share the risk. And therefore, um, uh, well, the government will play a very significant role as far as uh, providing adequate uh, mechanism to share the risk uh, being incurred by our farmers and our uh, hog racers and livestock uh, people. So uh, we need those. And of course, uh, we need more attractive agri-insurance products uh, to help our farmers. Uh, uh, if you check the statistics, very few of our farmers are accessing or getting agri-insurance products because, uh, well, uh, one is it's not so popular, uh, it's not so uh, objective, and it's too expensive for them. So uh, I think we need to address this uh, together with the different sectors, uh, particularly the Department of Agriculture and the local government units. So, so yun pong sinasabi nyo, yung either traditional uh, means of sharing climate risk or yung mga financial instruments like insurance. Ito po ay para sa mga nasisirang mga pananin, hindi po ba? Pero ano naman po yung ano? Ano naman yung po pwedeng uh, adaptation na gawin natin? So that we can, alala ko po, we, we just uh, were in the final stages of uh, uh, developing the nationally determined contributions of the Philippines. Tapos yung agricultural sector hindi masyadong, uh, uh, hindi pa, yung kanyang commitment as a sector uh, hindi masyadong malaki on mitigation. It's more on adaptation. How do we adapt to the climate uh, uh, to climate change and ensure that we still have food security? Ano, ano yung mga po okay. pwede natin gawin? Okay, Francis. Uh, marami ng uh, climate adaptation measures that has been developed and tested and in fact piloted. Ang isa dito ay yung uh, the natural uh, strategy is to plant or use improved crop varieties that are resistant or tolerant to these uh, climate stresses. Uh, we now have uh, varieties, rice varieties, for example, or corn varieties, uh, which are resistant to flooding, or what we call submarino variety. Meron ng submarino. It's being piloted in, uh, in Asia, by, by the way. Uh, we also have uh, drought tolerant varieties of rice. Okay, and also uh, of corn. There are also heat tolerant varieties as well as uh, salinity tolerant varieties. You know, uh, one of the effects of climate change is the uh, inundation of the low-lying crop production areas resulting to uh, increased salinity. Uh, pag salin ng iyong water, uh, that will significantly reduce uh, crop productivity kasi salay na yung iyong uh, uh, crop production areas. And uh, another uh, that was recently been developed by the scientific community 
ay yung tinatawag na AWD or Alternate Wetting and Drying Technology which results to about 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions without sacrificing the yield levels. Uh, okay, ano ba itong AWD? You provide water when it's needed. Unlike in the past, yung water provided to the plant like rice is you have standing water almost all of the time. Okay, and of course uh, that will be uh, uh, not an effective way of using available water when water is a problem. Okay, but then yung pala merong merong purpose yung standing water is basically essentially for weed control. But then uh, studies have done been done at Erie and also other uh, uh, research centers in Asia that we can uh, use AWD technology without sacrificing much the yield. But then at the same time, meron siyang mitigation co-benefits, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Then the other one, uh, which I'm working on now, is yung tinatawag nating adaptive planting calendar. Okay, this is actually, uh, okay, considering the historical weather data as well as the seasonal climate uh, information provided by Pagasa or the group of uh, uh, Manila Observatory, uh, we can use those information to determine when is the best time to plant a particular crop. Okay, so that is one particular response to tinatawag uh, natin adaptive planting calendar. And, and so with this project, we are developing a planting date calculator. So that will provide you the, the best planting date. And at the same time, considering the variety that you plant, uh, we can provide you estimates of yield. We can also provide you uh, estimates of the date of flowering of the crop and also the expected harvest time. So these are important informations aside from uh, the agri-insurance uh, that can be provided using the so-called weather index base or more objective agri-insurance products. Uh, hopefully uh, this will be implemented pretty soon by the PCIC uh, after uh, successful piloting in many areas. So uh, we have better options provided to the farmers so that we can increase the number of farmers subscribing to uh, agri-insurance products. Uh, thank, thank you for, for that, sir. No, it, it's good to know that we already have piloted some of these uh, technologies uh, so that we can adapt. Uh, meron na rin tayo medyo mahabang experience with insurance. But uh, katulad po natin ano ko kay Dr. Cruz, what are some of the gaps? You know, how much is the, how much of this information is used by the stakeholders, yung mga nasa agricultural sector? And what do you think can be done so that uh, hindi masayang itong research natin na ito at magamit talaga natin siya for adaptation? Good question, uh, Francis. Okay, while we have a number of climate change adaptation measures already available, okay, we, we need to act uh, smartly on this. We need to use them. Hindi lang sa nasa publication or nasa aparador or sa cabinet. Okay, so we need to use them to develop uh, what we refer to as the integrated plans and policies. For example, sa local government units, they are required to do uh, local climate adaptation plan, okay? Required yan, at saka yung tinatawag nating comprehensive land use plan, okay? Together with the uh, comprehensive development plan. So we need to incorporate all of these measures kasi hindi naman uh, one measure lang ang pwede. So it's a combination or uh, yeah, it's a suite of uh, climate change adaptation measures that you need to do to address this issue. Okay, there is also a problem of, uh, I'm glad that uh, the, the MO is working on uh, downscaling because there is this problem of data and knowledge sharing uh, from the national agencies down to the local government units. Okay, because uh, what as presented earlier by pay, uh, all those models uh, available are actually for uh, well, uh, global and uh, well, 
subnational level, okay, or even regional level. So what we need are more are data on the local local level uh, for planning. Okay, so we need to you need to provide the needed data by our planners in the local government units. Okay, uh, isa sa pa problema pa Francis na, na at least for the climate risk management uh, sector, yung institutional support uh, for agri insurance. For example, if you develop, even if you develop a more objective insurance products, like based on weather index based insurance, okay, the premium is very high. The premium is very high because of the premium tax imposed by government. Uh, imagine for non life insurance, 26 to 27% tax. Wow. So if you want to promote uh, subscription by farmers for the weather index based insurance, so one strategy is to lower the premium. And one way of lowering is make it small. Uh, so maybe about uh, 10 or less than 10%, or even, yeah. Because yung Yung non, yung non life insurance as per our policy in the government runs about 26 to 27 percent pero yung uh, yung life insurance is only two percent okay so that's one and uh, the other is uh, well mataas nga yung insurance premium perhaps we can explore the possibility of uh, LGU providing partly the cost of covering this insurance premium okay because if you know well uh, you spend money also in rescue and rehabilitation efforts when this a disaster comes so why not invest uh, look at this as an investment rather than a cost uh, kasi mas magastos pa pag rehabilitation na at saka recovery uh, so why not have this uh, strategy thank you yeah, well, thank you, sir. Uh, well, I, I think uh, well, na na re recall ko yung binanggit ni Dr. Cruz, no? yung interdisciplinary approach. Na hindi po pwede ng ano lang. Uh, hindi po na hindi pwede compliance lang. Pangalawa, you really have to look at the different interactions ng iba't ibang sector, no? Parang may parang kumisan parang ang layo, eh. isang magsasaka, intindihin niya yung insurance. Parang hindi but, but we really need to bring them together. Otherwise, uh, we will just have to, uh, stance, which is we just leave it to the, you know, the gods of, uh, you know, good weather and bountiful harvest. But the problem is it's not that simple, especially as we have seen, uh, things can get compounded or the problems can get compounded so easily no uh you experience that in covid uh, uh tells us that now, so dr lansigan uh, maraming salamat po and now we'll move to another sector no uh, uh which is also affected by uh climate change and i'd like to move to dr laura david uh naman po, ma uh, i mean sa inyong pag-aaral what have you you know what have you seen in our uh, marine uh, you know, marine environment. Uh, how does that? How does climate change or global warming translate? Uh, sa inyong field of uh, inquiry. Actually, sa amin parang mas malaki yung impact eh. Kasi pag nag-usap tayo ng climate change sa karagatan, kasama dun yung temperature, ocean acidification, sea level rise. Kasama rin yung change in rainfall, kakapetro rin yung sa near the coast. Um, so, lahat sila tatama sa atin. So, kailangan lahat tugunan. Kaya ang tanong is, ano, un, an, meron bang isa na dapat unahin at mayroon bang isa na dapat ngayon palang pinagahandaan na? So, ang sagot doon na, namin doon, pag tinignan mo sa buong Pilipinas, at least yung historical trends, ang isang common sa kanila is yung sea level rise. Sa atin talaga grabe yung tama. Uh, ang, at ang dahilan nito is katabi tayo ng Pacific Ocean, no? na napakalaki. So pag lumobo siya, sa atin naman papunta yung currents na yun. So tayo naman ang lumolobo. Kaya tayo yung pinakatatamahan. And maraming consequences ang sea level rise. Uh, uh, okay. 
Sige, go sige, ahead. Sige, sige, sige. Pa, una-una, um, yung mga mangroves mo. No? Pag, pag baby pa ang mangroves, madali siyang masira pag mataas yung tubig. Um, kung pristine environment at may magagalawan, no? syempre, yung next generation, dun na sa mas, mas tuyo. Aakit sila naturally. Ang problema natin karamihan ng mangroves natin, may kalsada sa likod, may promenade, merong, di ba, merong mall. So, paano siya uurong para makaligtas sa sea level rise? So, ang mangyayari, malulunod yung next generation. Uh, at malaki consequence nun. Kasi pag nalunod na si mangrove, ito uh, na, lahat ng sediment na dapat na nahahawakan niya, no? na erosion, Uus-us na yun. Pupunta na sa seagrass, pupunta sa coral. So, hindi lang siya yung tatamaan, pati sa seagrass at sa coral. At the same time, dahil nursery siya ng maraming commercially important fish na kinakain natin, uh, saan na sila mga anak? Saan na mga anak yung malalaking isda na yun? Saan lalaki yung mga binhi nila? Wala na rin. So, may cascade siya sa food security at sa livelihood. No? We have about 1.6 million fishers. So, lahat yun. Livelihood ng mga yun. Uh, konti lang naman ang commercial fishers natin o yung tinatawag na those who actually look for fish in a very deep sea. Most of them are coastal and most of them actually fish kung saan malapit si mangroves, si seagrass, si coral. So affected din yung kanilang livelihood. So marami yung cascade niya. And then um, the other one is with sea level rise. So kunyari ang, ang iyong coast hanggang dito lang dati ang dagat So ang tatamaan ng storm surge hanggang dito lang. Kahit na kano kataas siya, di ba? Eh pag andito na yung dagat, so yung storm surge mo hanggang dito. So yung effect din, yung mga domino effect ng additional, uh, it makes other things, uh, the, the effect of other things exacerbated. Mas grabe yung impact ng storm surge pag nagkaroon ka ng sea level rise. So dapat siya yung unang hanap, harapin natin. Po. Kasi yung yung mga uh, siguro uh, siguro ang isang ironic dito, isa tayong archipelago. Sabihin, ang daling pumunta sa dagat dito eh. Parang you drive two hours, maybe even less, going west or going east, tatama ka sa dagat eh. And yet it's something that we don't, uh, maka, hindi natin madalas maisip, no? Hindi... Uh, I've met people, for example, uh, hindi naman dagat, no? pero yung lawa ng uh, Laguna, it's interesting. Some people, na may mga nakilala ako na uh, siguro dahil lumaki sila doon sa highway <laughs> ng, ng Laguna, hindi nila ma-imagine yung lawa doon sa likod. At pag nagbabaha, uh, parang na, nabibigla pa sila. Samantalang, yan yun eh, kaya nga Laguna yung, ano eh, kaya nga Laguna yung pangalan ng probinsya kasi... It's a lake, no? Uh, there's a, this Laguna de Bay. But anyway, ma'am, yun na nga eh. Kasi yung experience natin sa climate change o yung reference natin sa climate change, usually yung mga dramatic events, yung mga extreme weather events, no? Uh, tatandaan ko yan, nung uh, 2009, uh, yung Ondoy, talagang, uh, you know, we were, you know, shaken by Ondoy. Even if, may nangyaring similar the year before, yung Typhoon Frank. Na malakas din, the same phenomenon, bumuhos ng maraming ulan, nagbaha. It's, kaya lang hindi masyadong na pagtuunan ng pansin kasi hindi NCR, hindi National Capital Region. Ilo-ilo but Ondoy was, yeah, ilo-ilo. But, but uh, you know, itong, ano, itong Ondoy, talagang na, 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 na bulat ang lahat. <laughs> Tingin ko yun yung, ano eh, yun yung isang tumimo sa isip natin. Then you, you got reminded again by, uh, by Yolanda. No? Pero before Yolanda, there was Pablo, there was Sendong. Kaya lang hindi siya, ano eh, hindi, kung bang hindi na pag-uugnay-ugnay. And I think that's because misteryoso pa din yung dagat para sa atin. I, I think, well, personally speaking, I mean, I, 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 I like going to the sea. Pero hindi ako masyadong, uh, ano eh, uh, mas mas gusto ko maging Superman kaysa Aquaman eh. <laughs> Hindi ko masyadong... Eh, and ano lang yan, siguro dahil bata pa ako, uh, lumaki rin po kasi ako sa coast. I, I grew up in Malolos. Uh, we were, we, we, uh, I was raised no, thinking na mayroong diwata dun sa ano, sa ilog. So, 
lagi kaming malayo doon kasi mga, mga, mga tipuhan ka nung diwata. No? But I think that's, that's it. Now, how do you then introduce adaptation measures sa isang ecosystem na hindi masyadong bahagi ng ating imagination o ng ating consciousness? What are some of these uh, ano po ba? adaptation measures or uh, risk management mechanisms na pwede natin gawin sa ating marine ecosystem? So, so tama ka, no? ang mga naaalala natin, kahit nakausapin yung mga mga tao, yung malalaking disasters. So una yon we can take advantage of that disaster. Uh, pakita kung anong ya- nangyari sa Yolanda, for example. And pakita kung ano nangyari kung may ginawa kang tama. If I may, I'll share one slide. Yes, please. The one slide of Yolanda. So dito, sa slide na ito, kita mo, this is uh, Tacloban on the left before Yolanda hit. And this is Tacloban right after. Right? So talagang burado. Ilan, ilan lang yung natirang struktura. And yet, a few kilometers northeast sa Palompon, 3.6 meter storm surge din ang tumama, ang dumating sa kala. And yet, kita mo, bubong lang natanggal. Andyan yung structure. Unlike sa Tacloban. Bakit? Because if you take a look at the very uh, top of that image, meron kang mangrove, na isang isla offshore nila na punong-puno ng mangrove. So na-attenuate no, na humina yung lakas ng energy ng storm surge because of that. So I think things like this need to be highlighted para makita yung pag-preserve ng environment, hindi yun para sa environment lang. Ang pag-preserve ng environment, preservation natin. We're, we are island people. Talagang tatamaan tayo at tatamaan tayo ng climate change. So we need to realize that nakalink ang survival natin sa health nila. I think that's the first and foremost. And then, you know, you, you also have to show na maraming, maraming eh, sa pagkain na lang. Kunyari ikaw, Francis, sa, sa pagkain na lang, no? this last month, Ilang beses ka either nagsabinas, isda, bangus, tilapia. Pag inisip mo, ang dami na nagre-rely sa marine environment. And yet, hindi mo naisip na, paano yun? Pag nasira yun, paano ko? Hindi natin nalilink. Um, but unless dun ka talaga nakatira, no, fisher yung family mo, dun mo lang na- nare-realize. Pero tayo dito, lalo na sa NCR, <laughs> Um, parang so far removed when in reality our very survival is linked to this. And yeah. What I think um, is one thing we can do though and let me go to just one more slide is take advantage of this fact or two slides pala. Na yung ating mangrove and seagrass na dapat alagaan because tatamaan sila ng, ng climate change. Sila rin yung makakapagbaba ng climate change itself kasi they sequester carbon no so this shows na si seagrass halos kapantay niya in tropical forest sequestration si mangroves si estuarine and oceanic mangroves ang laki ang laki nung kinutuktok niya na carbon so pag inalagaan mo siya you also reduce that increase in temperature and all the cascading effects of climate change so dapat alagaan mo siya and since sa Philippines, meron naman tayong almost 3 million hectares of seagrass. Uh, pwedeng-pwede natin gawin yon, Alagaan sila. Tapos si mangrove, 0.3 million na lang hectares tayo. 10% of the original. But we can also make use of that. Kasi there are two things. There's a debt for nature swap. Ginawa sa Amazon, di ba? So Brazil took advantage of it, Colombia took advantage of, the, of their own terrestrial environment. Pwede natin sabihin yun, si seagrass, we will keep a seagrass, alagaan namin, hindi namin siya tatayuan ng, ng port, hindi namin siya puhukayin dahil sa resort. Uh, that, that for nature swap. For every hectare, bibigyan tayo ng mundo because that's, sequester, that's sequestering your carbon. Doon naman sa konti na tayo, mangroves, that's an adaptation mitigation partnership. Pag meron kang tinanin na mangrove, that's additional sequestration. And we have, since our original 3 million, 
Ngayon, 0.3 na lang. We have 2.7 million hectares that we can plant back. Kasi kung saan siya natural na meron, pwede mo siya ibalik. Diba? Pero saan ka kukuha ng funds? Alam mo naman natin, ang funds natin ay iilan lang. So, one more last. Uh, my take is, if we take a look at that 2.7 million hectares, at kinalculate mo ilan ang masesequester niya, na carbon, you're talking about uh, 3.8 million thousand metric tons of carbon dioxide. Pag tinani mo yung 2.7 million. Katumbas na yun ang niinilalabas, ibinubugan ng buong European Union sa isang taon. Diba? So sila na kailangan mag-sequester ng carbon na hindi na nila kaya i-sequester. Ayaw nila tigilan yung kanilang mga ginagawa. They help us. They invest here in order for us to sequester, sequester the carbon for them. Sa atin naman, ganaan siya tayo kasi madami isda, may, merong pagkain, merong trabaho ang fisher, may added protection sa storm surge. Diba? So win-win siya. So I think that's what we need to push. That's what I'm trying to push. Carbon offset using mangrove. And with the carbon producing countries, investing in us, uh, not just in the car mangrove itself, but actually in securing jobs, in providing food, in saving lives. Yeah. Well, thank you, po, uh, Dr. Laura. Uh, well, I was just wondering, um, uh, okay, obviously, we have time research then. So we have the science. What uh, are ano ano, ano the gaps? Na naman? Kasi yun yung ating tanong eh. Uh, we have the science. Merong, there seems to be a gap. Uh, kasi ano po kaya yun pagdating sa marine uh, environment or marine ecosystem? Um, Saan po yung gaps natin? Dalawa. Sa mangrove, ang gap, ang, ang gap natin is sino may ari ng mangrove? Para sino magdidesisyon? Sa LGU ba siya? Kasi it's within the LGU territory. Sa DNR ba siya? Because it's a forest. Sa BFAR ba siya kasi tinataniman siya ng mariculture. So unless we finally decide on that and we actually have just one body that we can talk to, mahirap yun. Kahit na may pera ka, sino, sino gagalaw? Sino mag-alaga? So that's one. The other one is seagrass. We do not have enough appreciation of seagrass. Hindi, na, hindi natin napapansin na yung danggit na kinakain natin, wala yun pag walang seagrass. Diba? Si Lamayo, wala yun. Si, Sa si Sambal, wala yun. Kasi iba-ibang stages lang yun actually ni Danggit. Eh. The baby ones, the big ones, and so on. So, ang laki rin ng fisheries yun. Pero, pag nakakita ka ng mangrove reforestation, di ba yung mga picture taking sa mangrove reforestation, saan mo nakikita tinatanim? Sa tubig, kung saan may seagrass. So okay lang kapakapakan si seagrass, okay lang sirain si seagrass basta makapagtanim ng mangrove. Eh, that's a wrong place to put a mangrove. A mangrove is not going to grow there. Kaya ang, ang baba ng, ng survival rate ng ating mangrove reforestation. Your mangrove should be planted higher up. Because we don't care about seagrass. Okay, well, um, nakuha ko doon, well, we need to get... Uh... Well, coordinate more coordinated in terms of you know uh, who's looking after that particular uh, ecosystem. Kasi nga ibat iba yung stakeholders eh. At uh, kuminsan, uh, well, mas madalas pala yung mga most important things fall through the cracks. No, uh, hindi siya na tule hindi siya na address. And again, I think uh, ang translation sa akin yan, it has to be uh, inter again interdisciplinary. And I'm just wondering, uh, how much local research, katulad po nung ginagawa sa Manila Observatory where they are, you know, downscaling or yung mas, mas nagpo-focus sila, nag-zoom in sila. How much uh, information do we have? Uh, lalo sa mga critical marine uh, uh, ecosystems natin. Uh, yeah. Do we have that information? We do. We, we do have that. Uh, just one slide that I'll show you it as an example. Um, we have, oops, where's that slide? Oh, this slide. Um, so this slide 
shows you. So we looked at historical data, 30 years data of trends. So this is what we see, the trends where there's, so there's numbers associated with this, but because of science communication, we just use symbols. So there's trends in sea level rise, extreme heating events, increasing ocean temperature, disturbed water budget like indoor and extreme rainfall. And then there's overlaid over um, research that's done on your mangrove seagrass coral. This way you can pinpoint exactly where you should concentrate. So here, sa right side, yung sa table, nakikita nyo, sa ARMM, actually, ang pinakamaraming mangrove na pinakamaraming impact sa fishers at mataas yung sea level rise kasi ng mga So we're at least down to a provincial level. Uh, in some areas where we have studies na mas, ano, we're down to municipal level. We can even say kung anong municipio yung kailangan tamnan. So there is, there is data. Ngayon, ano kailangan in addition? Um, uh, yung sea level rise scenario ng bawat coastal barangay, yan ang wala pa. Kasi kailangan yan very detailed uh, topography para makita mo saan talaga papasok yung dagat pag makit siya. So we're doing a lot of that on the ground. Uh, no, LIDAR, the LIDAR the, uh, data of NOAA is also helping a lot. But I think we need to do a lot more coastal work so we can yeah. go in to the barangay level. To the barangay level. Uh, <clears throat> well, marami na pong ano, marami pala tayong mga comments na dito sa ating chat box and we'll go address those afterwards. But uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Laura David, for your discussion on the marine, the impacts of climate change on the marine ecosystem. Ah, well, tahabo lang po. Ano yung, uh, uh, yung COVID ba naapektuhan din yung ginagawa niyo sa marine science? Opo. Uh, sa side namin sa research, definitely naapektuhan. Pero sa fishers din. Kasi wala yung uh, market nila eh. From their catch to the market. For a long time, hindi makatranslate yun. May mga... NGOs na nakatulong, uh, nag direct buying over the internet, ganyan, which helps. So I think we should do more of that. No? Mawawala din yung mga middleman actually. Mas makikinabang ang fishers that way. Um, so there's, a, there's now a positive light to what happened because now actually they ended up earning more kung na-link sila to the market directly. Um, pero mar oh, marami silang, ano, at the same time, uh, dahil nga they are the sector that's poorest of the poor, kasama sila ng farmers, no? Nag, nagaganyanan lang sila ng farmers. Uh, yung mga nagkasakit, mahirap din silang tumakbo. So, kailangan, I mean, feel health help. Marami sa kanila may feel health na ngayon. Thankfully, yung know, mga fishers. Uh, pero still, I think, uh, in terms of health, we need to take care of them more. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh sa ating mga na, nauna tagapagsalita uh, kay Dr. Faye Cruz, uh, kay Dr. Lansigan, at kay Dr. David. No? Uh, Ini-imagine ko lang itong usapan na to parang ano talaga eh, uh, yung, uh, yung ating bahay, which is uh, yung diniscuss ni Dr. Cruz, tapos yung kanin na diniscuss ni Dr. Lansigan, at ulam na diniscuss ni si Dr. David. Uh, pupunta naman po tayo sa ating uh, susunod at pagsalita. The last but not the least. Titingnan naman natin na, okay, if we have this science research, if we have this science data, uh, yung malaking science data na sinizero-in nga natin sa particular areas, and then you have the research from the agricultural sector and the uh, uh, you know, marine sector, paano natin siya i ano? I mean, what, what, what do we need to do with all this data? Uh, to so that we can really say that we are adapting not only to the climate crisis but also preparing ourselves for future shocks, katulad ng pandemic. No, uh, I mean COVID with the sa salubong darating na daw yung bakuna. Eh. But you know, kahit na bakuna tayo, there might be others. No, so pwede may future shock. So yun yung gusto nating ano? Gusto nating i, i uh, hopefully uh, I mean. We've invited Dr. Toby Monson to, uh, you know, share her, you know, insights and views on this. Papa, ano ba natin tuwa doon, Dr. Toby? <laughs> okay. That wasn't the lead, lead up question I was expecting. Um, 
can I just, okay. I, I think clearly. The, sige, sige. Yeah, no, let, let me go back to the lead up question. No, 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 no. It's okay. Okay. All right. Because <laughs> no, I was uh, getting very interested, especially in what um, Doc Lant, with all of them were saying. And the, okay. of course, the, uh, the proposals of um, Doc Eno and, uh, and, and, Laura, and Doc Laura um, uh, resonate, right? Uh, because the, the question then becomes, how does this fit in uh, with respect to uh, development policy and plans, right? And especially with respect to the, economic, uh, uh, the macro economy, right? Um, the reason why that link is important is because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of the, um, well, the environment is kind of, well, it's controlled by economic managers, right? In terms of um, policies and plannings. And so the question becomes, um, do these findings from climate science have any bearing on macroeconomic management, right? Do, does it have any bearing in national development policy and planning? Well, you know, the, the, the short answer is mm, not quite. Okay, so, and, and I guess I, I need to explain why, you know, and, and so you'll know why, you know, what is the weak link. Okay, and um, I, okay, so I have a few, I have five, at most five slides, as you said, let me show you one, the first one. Okay, the first one. Uh, just just to uh, remind everyone, right? You know, when we say macroeconomic management, uh, the goals of macro policy, you know, what Secretary Dominguez and, and uh, Carl Chua and all those people talk about, the goals of the macroeconomic uh, ma policy is, what is it? GDP and GDP growth, right? Um, high employment, uh, low unemployment, uh, price stability, meaning low inflation. Um, that is the goal of macroeconomic um, policy. Consequently, um, our economic team uh, uh, aim for low price inflation, meaning hindi tataas yung presyo ng bigas and other, and other goods. They want um, what they call wide fiscal space. What is that? That means that there's enough money to fund uh, all these programs without getting into so much debt, okay? So you want, you want to collect more taxes so that you can fund public goods and all this stuff, right? Um, without any danger of, of um, without any danger of uh, getting the, the country into any financial trouble. Um, of course, economic managers aim for what? High GDP growth, right? And so parang kwanyane, parang headline indicator, oh, we grew only 6% now or 5% or it's 7% and, and so forth, et cetera, from last year. And if you, if you recall, or if you, um, uh, if you notice, you know, one of the, um, how do you say, it? one of the aspirations of the country apparently is to become a high middle income country, right? So that's the, framing of aspirations from a macroeconomic view. And so, um, you know, coming into the pandemic, for instance, um, Mejo, uh, our managers were a little, con uh, well, confident because they said, you know, we've over a decade of high and robust growth. And in fact, in the fourth quarter of 2019, we had um, a really high, uh, we, we registered I don't know, 6.7 or something like that, GDP growth, second only to China in the ASEAN uh, plus three region, right? So all of these aspirations are embodied in the Philippine Development Plan, right? growth, growth per capita, employment, um, unemployment, lowering poverty incidence, and so forth, okay? Um, okay, can you just press down uh, whoever's controlling it? Okay, unfortunately, GDP is a very, very poor gauge of, um, of welfare and progress. Um, it is how do, notoriously incong incongruent with a number of things. Uh, the, the primary one for our purpose is that environmental damage and other bads, meaning things that are 
you know, uh, result in negative spillovers for the rest of um, uh, the market, those are not registered in GDP. Okay. So for instance, um, you may have a lot of uh, production, you know, uh, production of out, for example, okay, in Laguna de, ba de Bai or in Pasig River, you can have factories who are, which are working or fish, uh, fish farms that are producing output, okay? Um, pollution into, the, into Laguna de Bai or Pasig is not accounted for in those numbers. So if you pollute, your output doesn't go down, right? They don't correct for that. And so GDP does not correct for environmental damage. So for instance, what Laura was talking about, mangroves and, and seagrass, um, uh, if, if industries or, or businesses cause damage to that, that is not corrected for in GDP. What GDP will see is the output of those uh, factories and, and, and commercial uh, uh, activities without, um, without uh, adjusting for the damage caused to mangroves, for instance, or seagrass. Uh, GDP also does not um, correct for quality, right? So it's just really quantity. Um, and so it's a very poor gauge, as you see in the quotation, you know, this is uh, by, um, you know, this is the human development perspective. Now, if, you know, if you have GDP that values the production of guns or uh, stuff like that, many times more than the production of milk, then you, one must question why we are using that as a measure of progress. Okay. Um, which kind of answers the question, well, how does climate science factor in? That's why I said not much, right? If you go to the um, next slide, you know, here, well, GDP and growth really is only about incomes, right? But when we talk about development, hopefully um, economists really want to, um, really should be looking at welfare. And, and, and outcomes and, and improving the quality of life, right? And if you, don't, if you don't see that, then the picture is very different. So for instance, the Philippines um, over the last 10 years, high robust GDP growth, right? Second only to China in the last quarter of 2019. But if you look at its progress with respect to human development, you see it on the screen. We are the black line, okay? We are the black line. And if you notice, Countries have overtaken us in terms of um, in terms of human development. Um, so over this period, this is only since 1990 to 2015. Thailand has overtaken us. China has overtaken us. Um, East Asia and the Pacific countries as a whole, the average, has overtaken us. Indonesia is actually we're equivalent. Um, we are now have the same HDI. Vietnam may soon overtake it. As, as you look, as you see from the slope of the yellow line, right? And so um, that's what happens when we forget that incomes like GDP is not the same as outcomes. Um, and outcomes, by outcomes, we're talking about the quality um, of life. Um, so uh, we are led to believe that we are resilient. Right, so uh, like coming into the pandemic, our economic managers actually said, this was in March, 2020, that um, economic fundamentals are on our side. And they thought that even in the worst possible scenario, the worst scenario, we would still grow in 2020 by, um, we'd still grow in 2020 and in the medium term by about 6%. That's what they thought in March. Okay, um, the next slide, you'll see that Obviously, this did not happen, right? They spoke too soon. And so you see that um, we kind of fell really steeply um, in the second quarter of last year. And over the entire year, uh, we had the sharpest reversal in growth among our regional neighbors. So our profound lesson uh, was that we're not as economic uh, resilient um, as we think or thought. And for me, that, that, that was very profound because it sort of tells you, um, well, you know, what does that mean? Shouldn't we be changing track, right? Are we still going to be shooting for the same, you know, 
um, output growth? Uh, do we still plan in the same way? Do we still set our agri targets in the same way, our marine uh, fisheries targets in the same way, and so forth? In the next slide, you know, so uh, myself, a colleague and myself, we, we, we tried to look at what happened, right? As an economy, we were supposed to be strong, robust, strong, coming into the pandemic, but we had the worst outcomes among our neighbors. And so what happened? And we found that, um, that it had to do with institutions that we had prior uh, to the pandemic, right? So it was not the lockdown. Everyone is blaming the lockdown per se. The thing is the lockdown was something we had to do because we were not prepared. So the issue is, um, you know, how were we organized um, for health issue for, for, you know, on this front, right? In terms of emerging diseases, et cetera, before the pandemic. And um, we saw that clearly we were not, and that was, that was the deal breaker. Right. What this graph shows is so we it, that point where that black bulb is that that shows you that we dropped by about negative 14 percent um, percentage points in terms of uh, growth. Right. Because of the pandemic, if we had just been a little more prepared, like Vietnam or as you see in this graph, Thailand or Korea, then we would have saved about um, three percentage points. Uh, 3.6 percentage points in lost uh, growth forecasted that was about that that comes to about 680 billion pesos right if if only we did our homework because th the pandemic was not something unexpected um in 2005 you know who and, and everyone was already saying we need to prepare for these things um uh, many countries learned from sars you know the uh, the asian flu and all that we didn't quite do that, right? And um, and 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 that's what happened. Okay, so if you just press down, um, this really this really uh, challenges us, um, both our policymakers at the national and the local level, to parang rethink our aspirations, right? Um, what exactly do we need? for resilience um, as an economy, as a national and local economy. What are those fundamentals? Is it still the same um, you know, income and income growth or something else? And what we're, what we're seeing from, from the pandemic is that when it comes to physical shocks, right? So the pandemic was a physical shock, which is different from all the other typical, typical economic shocks that we have, which are usually financial, right? Um, in an era of physical shocks, we have to do things differently. And climate, um, climate uh, change, climate hazards are uh, uh, represent physical shocks, right? So that's the main point of this. Okay, so um, what we know to be uh, how we manage the economy will not apply to climate related shocks, it will probably not apply. Um, and so what it, what's telling, what it tells us is that we really have to look at essential institutions. We're not talking about fiscal space and less about that and more about capacity, local government capacity, national government capacity in terms of um, uh, food systems, uh, social protection um, and so forth. Okay? Um, press down one more time. Okay, so uh, the, the insight actually um, by many deep thinkers um, and also uh, among us, right, is that um, what we saw in the pandemic is, is like a foretaste, could be seen as a foretaste of what could happen um, in a full-blown climate crisis, right? So we should be expecting um, a series of that um, based on the science, right? Um, so, you know, that's what I think the insight is um, in terms of macroeconomic um, uh, research. Now we have more evidence to say that uh, resilience um, to climate change has to go beyond simply GDP growth, um, has to go beyond income generating activities. It really needs a, 
rethinking of how we view um, agriculture, agricultural um, uh, products, even the, uh, as Laura is saying, the management of our marine ecosystems. And for me, it also has to do with changing our um, headline target, because even in the Philippine Development Plan, you know, our aspiration is still GDP growth. It's like, what does that tell us? You know, and there's an HDI indicator too, but I think it will, you know, even HDI has to um, incorporate uh, other other aspects of resilience. Well, thank you, Dr. Toby. Yeah. Nakapula, nakapula pa yung ano, yung, uh, the current pandemic provides perhaps a foretaste of what a full-fledged climate crisis yeah. would entail. Yeah. Uh, may John, uh, uh, while you were discussing it, iniisip ko pa paano nga pala, no? What if it's, you know, if it's really a foretaste, paano na kaya tayo? And it, uh, you know, when, we, when we come back, we'll have a, we'll take a short break. Uh, so that we can also collect the uh, questions from our viewers. But maybe we'll discuss later. Like if you have all these gaps, if you have institutional gaps, if we have uh, problems of coordination uh, in the different government agencies, Papano, how do we address those gaps? What, what, could, what can be done? You know? if, it, if GDP, for example, is not uh, enough, uh, how can we... How can we address some of these uh, new imperatives in our planning? Uh, uh, what, what I've heard is that we need to localize. We need to localize climate information, localize marine, uh, agri you know, systems information, and maybe also planning. Uh, before we go for the break, what's, what's your, uh, Toby, can you tell us, what are we doing trying to yeah, because sabi mo nga, yung the old style of planning uh, for these things ay kulang. What needs to happen? Um, well, let me just respond to the thing about local and, and that will, uh, that will um, sort of say something. No? Uh, clearly, with respect to, well, first of all, I, I think from a, not from a development framework, we really have to uh, uh, mainstream um, uh, climate uh, climate, the climate science, science, climate change, and so forth, right? Um, the updated PDP does that a little better than the one, than the original PDP. The updated one came out on February 5. It was launched in February 5. And resilience is, is a little more embedded, you know? Um, it's still not clear to me as to um, whether or not strategies on the ground will really pivot, right? Because um, what it means is that we have to change incentives so that things like the project of LORA, right? The, the adaptation mitigation, what was it called? Adaptation mitigation, um, the carbon, carbon offset, right? Those things, we have to, we have to pivot um, certain, I think, uh, 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 evaluation indicators, investment evaluation indicators at, at the, national level, so projects like that um, would be approved uh, more than the standard infrastructure uh, stuff that may not be, will, that may not contribute to resilience as much. You understand? So what happens kasi at the development um, policy level is all these proposals come in and then they're evaluated using certain standard parameters. If those parameters are biased against um, uh, long-term uh, benefits, for instance, if they're biased in favor of shorter term impacts, then things like uh, what Laura is proposing will not, will not get funded, um, the, the, the common, for ex you know, build, 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 right? build, build, build. It's not very clear in build, 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 whether or not they have a factor there for um, resilience. It's not clear, right? I haven't seen it. Let, let me put it that way, right? Um, and so the question is, how do you now uh, compare, how do you now account for uh, adaptation capital or resilience capital, right? Both at the local, regional and national levels. How do you incorporate that? I'm, I'm not sure 
we've really thought of that. Um, and that will make a difference to, um, uh, to what goes through, right? Um, interestingly, I, I just need to say, you know, the, in your first episode, you had Mandawe, you had Giwan. Palawan. Palawan. Yeah, yeah. Giwan and, and, uh... I, I, read the, <laughs> I read the accounts. I did not notice any one of them acknowledging the participation of the national government. Mm-hmm. It was all local, it was all external funded, but there was no significant participation of the national government. I'm not sure what, I just thought that was so uh, notable, right? On the one hand, it tells you that um, uh, the, the action should really be at the local level. It could be at the um, uh, uh, city or municipal level or at the province level, depending on scale, for instance. So what, what Giwan was talking about in terms of changing cropping patterns, etc., perhaps from an economic viewpoint, that's okay within Giwan. But if you're talking about mangroves, etc., it's very hard to divide the sea by political jurisdictions, by municip. You know, you may have to go province, right, or island. I'm not sure. So those things have to be worked out. That's what Laura is saying. Who are we talking to, the municipio or to the province? And that's an economic question, right? We have rules for that as to what is the most efficient scale. But in, no, in none of your case studies did the national government figure. And so it, it, um, I think that's a challenge to the national government, not to take control, right? But to find a way to enable it, right? And also find a way to ensure that you that that things are uh, um, coordinated and they don't what do you call it backfire on each other. So that's what we mean by efficient scale. It cannot be if one municipal does something, it it has negative bearing on on the neighboring municipality. You know, or if there are extra if there are spillovers between municipalities, then one must go to the provincial level for these for these things. Right? Those are the sort of rules I'm talking about. But very clearly, because resilience may be defined differently, right? Differently based on our archipelago and the fact that our country is so geographically diverse, then clearly the, the, the action has to happen at subnational levels. And, and, the, and, and the national government um, uh, has, to, has to support that, right? Um, the opportunity is the Madanas ruling. Right? There's a the, the Supreme Court decision on Madanas where a lot more money is going to be go, going to the subnational levels, the IRA. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're okay. familiar with that, right? So this represents a very uh, important opportunity for, for subnational action. And, and I think, you know, um, because the national government is has no choice but to, to to push down the money. And so perhaps we will see, we will hear less of uh, local government saying we couldn't find funds, right? Because now they have more funds. And, um, and, and so there's more opportunity to mainstream and national government will need to find strategic, um, strategic ways to support that. Oh yeah, so ang um, um, nakuha ko doon, uh, sub-national, I mean, that, that's the arena, no? sub-national work, uh, research, planning, bringing in all information, etc. na hindi po pwedeng walang pakialam yung national. Hindi. Tapos, I mean, no, no. Di ba? no, what I'm saying is that, well, first of all, all I said was that none of them acknowledge national. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Right? Uh, I don't think yeah. that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's what I observed, right? Research, by the way, typically should be supported at the national level. Why? Because you want to share that knowledge, right? Um, information is a global good, public good. And, and so, you know, to a certain degree, you need, um, you know, there, there are certain rules on how to assign these things, municipal, province, national. It doesn't mean that national does it, but it could mean that national must provide incentives so that research is done, but then it can take that research and share it with others, right? 
which um, it is in a better position to do. So I'm not saying that dapat walang pakialam. I think mm -hmm. that they haven't found their proper role. And right. what, I, okay. what, what you're showing, what I saw, was that there are really good case studies where they're doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that's good for the country overall. I'm not saying mm -hmm. for national mm -hmm. to take control. But we have to, you know, you have to support it such that um, more people benefit from any knowledge or any um, any uh, yeah uh, knowledge or or benefits that are produced. And that leads me to maybe a question that uh, uh, our panel can address. So, um, well, yung mga problema ng kinakaharap natin, you know, for example food security. I mean, it's not just limited to the Philippines. I know there are systems yung ASEAN so that, you know, in case of shortages brought about by, uh, you know, it, it could be, you know, a physical shock you know, from climate, you know, loss and damage. May mga systems yan eh. I'm just wondering if there's a way where your work, yung agricultural, res yung research natin sa agriculture, research natin sa uh, marine ecosystems at yung paano yung sharing na sinasabi no kasi yung yung research natin should benefit everyone no? especially in our region and i'm talking about the southeast asia region no uh, hindi na po yung uh, regions as in subnational ano po yung ano yun? what is the what, what do you see as the potentials of uh, cooperation across the southeast asia region sa inyong mga uh, sectors or areas of uh, research so, kami ni Sir Eno were part of a group a long time ago that actually uh, involved sharing of good practices doon sa iba-ibang bansa. No? Kasi iba-iba rin ang approach. Um, tayo napaka-heterogeneous kasi nung ating region. Iba-ibang types of government, iba-ibang religion. And that factors in actually in, in conservation work. Uh, iba-ibang kultura. No? Um, and yet, there are similarities kasi pare-pareho naman tayo ng mahilig sa isda, pare-pareho tayong kung ano kinakain natin, kanin, ganyan. Uh, and therefore, may mga practices that cut across sana. Some things that we do well here, they get translated well in other places as well. Tapos and vice versa. So siguro yun, una-una, uh, we need to keep uh, that going, that type of work going. Uh, learn from our neighbors as well as let them know what we can we have done here. Uh, kung mali yung ginawa natin, they should also know that. Huwag natin ikahiya. Because that's helping them as well. So. Okay, okay uh, Francis. Uh, yes, sir. For your information, there is, uh, in the ASEAN, there is a technical working group on food security. That's the ASEAN technical working group on food security. There is another technical working group on climate change. And these are different people, okay? So uh, I think there, there, is a, there is an issue there. So when you work on uh, food, climate change affecting food security, I think you need to work with these two technical working groups. And these technical working groups are the one advising the ministers or the secretaries of the different countries, okay? So, um, well, uh, fortunately, uh, alam mo naman yung initiative ng ng Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, yung ating ASEAN expert on climate change. Okay? And hopefully, uh, through this network, we can mobilize the, the right people in our respective countries to make use of this uh, climate change adaptation measures or strategies to address the issue of food security in the respective countries. So, pwede tayong magtulungan. Uh, ito, ito yung this was actually launched during the, mm -hmm. uh, the Asia Pacific Climate Week sa Bangkok. Uh, okay, so may, I think this is promising. So we need to link this group also with the ASEAN Technical Working Group on Climate Change as well as uh, food security. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Serena. Uh, Doc Fay, ikaw. Well, kayo talagang Southeast Asia yung... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, since uh, we actually like uh, got together since 2013, itong Cordae Southeast Asia. And so, yeah, and our, uh, we're, we're still working together. And um, I think 
it, it was really a, a, a good strategy because we were able to achieve a lot more. And it's not just the sharing of the tasks, there's the knowledge sharing. And also we tried um, like once or twice a year to get together and talk about, you know, what we've learned. Um, and so there's that, uh, and then um, like a sharing of our experiences and best practices. And so uh, we're actually finishing the third phase of um, our collaboration, but we're hoping to still continue that. Um, as you may know, and as you will hear, there's a new set of climate projections that's going to come out soon. And so uh, there, it means that there's another round of downscaling that we will need to do so that we can update <laughs> these projections. And so, yes, um, it has been uh, a very fruitful collaboration. So. I'm very thankful that um, to have, to be part of that, and so we're also inviting um, you know, other people, other research institutes and government agencies to also um, take part of this collaboration. Yes. Well, thank you for that, uh, Toby. Would you like to react on that or respond to that? Uh, not really. Southeast Asia. <laughs> Southeast Asia. No, no. I, I just. I just think that, uh, you know, um, information is, a, like I said, a global public good. And, and I think that, um, which means that, which means that there are benefits to it, which we cannot capture in the market, right? Um, and therefore, uh, that, that provides the justification for more support, you know, for public, uh, public support on, on that basis alone. Um, so I really think, um, you know, more for me, you know, we're just the development planning people, right? And so the, the, the question is, you know, how can we um, better incorporate that? And, and um, it, it gives uh, us homework, well, me or, you know, parang, uh, government agencies to, to really review the, the parameters in terms of what, what is funded and what is not, diba? Um, and, and my interest is to find out, you know, how how that is happening um, in other countries, right? And whether or not uh, there is something there we can pick up, right? How do people um, evaluate the adaptation contribution of certain investments versus others, or the resilience contribution, right? There are, there are studies on an international level, but how do we apply it here in real in real terms, right? So that. And so, you know, Laura, I will be um, getting your <laughs> data on that on that carbon offset. I think that's really interesting to try to quantify, you know, um, and and see and use it as a use it as a demonstration of you know what passes and what doesn't maybe, um, and and also yeah, uh, Doc Imus. Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, then, Pa. Okay, well, uh, alam naman natin that we'll, we'll tackle a very big area of uh, uh, interest. Kaya wala naman tayong ambition na i-address natin lahat. But I think we have, uh, we have uh, highlighted the most important parts. No? Uh, masabi natin, yung research is kailangan natin yan uh, to support our planning. And that should happen with the participation, different roles, sabi nga ni Toby, ng national agencies, subnational uh, agencies, and institutions. Uh, plus, yung ating linkages with uh, those in our region, the Southeast Asia region. Kasi nga, baka naman may ginagawa sila na uh, meron tayong ma-pick up. Or vice versa, baka naman may ginagawa tayo that we can we can share because really all these physical shocks, climate change for sure, pandemics as we have witnessed, uh, mga nailangan ito ng ano eh, solidarity. Not only within yung communities natin, no? Ay, hindi lang yung ating barangay or bayan. Sabihin, luma, ano siya, meron siyang repercussions, meron siyang impact dun sa mas malaking community. And I think the sooner we heed the signals, yung sinasabing foretaste ng a full-fledged climate crisis. Nakita na natin eh. Uh, uh, the sooner we realize na merong mga lessons dyan na mapag-aaralan natin and factor in into our development process, 
baka yun yung ano yun yung kailangan natin so that we can not only survive climate change or survive this pandemic but actually but actually thrive kasi yun naman yata yung talagang dapat nating habulin to thrive uh, even if you are faced with uh, this big uh, challenges So with that, uh, I'd like to thank our panel, kay uh, Dr. Fay Cruz, Dr. Filin Yulansigan, Dr. Laura David, and Dr. Toby Monsod for this very informative uh, panel. And uh, I hope you can uh, stay back for, because we might, we'll just collect the questions and fill them to you after showing this uh, short video. So maraming salamat po, and you know, uh, hope to see you again after this video. In taking into consideration the climate scenarios, increased temperature, varying intensity and timing of rainfall patterns, and the observable trends of change in terms of frequency and intensity of tropical cyclones, they add to the factor human-induced pressure on the land and water sources. The application of three act the management of watersheds, were included in the our SICA. PPS programs and plans. In the process, identified reforestation within the watershed areas, plus trail application, and community management as strategies to provide long-term solution to the water supply in Corona. CRN continuing uh, role to address climate impacts focusing on the water issue while addressing the pandemic. Enforcement on payment for ecosystem services, restorative ecosystem adaptation approach, working towards resilience of coral. And even upon the emergence of the pandemic, we still continue the search on with um, online workshops so that we can we have, were able to conduct problem tree, establish problem tree. We identified critical systems of interests for the city. Plus, we were able to continue with the conduct of ICAs, all of which form part of our CCAF, which is also has been mainstreamed sa ating LCCAF. the city cannot do it alone. We need collaboration with neighboring cities as well as uh, other stakeholders to, in order to mitigate as well as to adapt to the new norm. Is that very important? Is the this is a locally driven climate action? We tried to involve communities from the formulation of the LC Cup up to the formulation of the climate change adaptation framework. 
because we know that they are the, the local communities are at the for, for, forefront of the impacts of climate change. And then, of course, to build resilience from the impact of climate change, there, there needs to be coherence in creating development and shaping the way communities and local actors are able to reduce climate change vulnerabilities. formulation of our climate change adaptation framework and with the pandemic one common denominator that we've learned uh, that would be the strengthening the community engagement if there is no engagement if there is no buy-in within the community would be harder to implement this program engagement and empowering the community would be the key not necessarily to resolve it right away but it would make the implementation of the project easy um, we cannot uh, discount the fact that even with this pandemic, we still have to address the economic situation in our locality, given that some businesses that have to fold up because of the, of the pandemic. That's why the Balancing Act is there and how we can uh, provide livelihood or sustain livelihood for our people and prevent further transmission of the virus in our area. So that it, it has to be a balancing act. COVID-19, huh? what we have learned is uh, being a challenge that was a challenge by thinking outside the box. So the resilience of climate plants depends on the people who have clear understanding of the importance and the consequences of willing to implement them despite the ongoing pandemic. Of course, um, our resilience was tested. It's being tested until now. The pandemic showed us that it is not enough to survive, but to also we need to accept and to move forward despite all the odds of this new reality. We believe that no amount of planning for development is ever enough if we can't even plan to be resilient in the first place. Nagbabalik po tayo dito sa ating webinar. Uh, uh, Danica, are you, are you ready for the second session? Uh, I-hand over ko na po kay Danica yung uh, pagpapadaloy. Uh, again, maraming salamat dun sa mga una nating panelists. Uh, I hope they can stick around so that we can address some of the questions later. Kinokolekta pa po natin. And uh, Danica will uh, take over the second session where we will continue looking at uh, ano ba yung mga pwede nating gawin? How, how is research being done to address the twin, the twin crisis of the pandemic and climate change? Pero ngayon, mas ano, mas, uh, mas siguro mas mag-zoom in tayo sa ilang lugar. Tama, Tama ba, Danica? Tama. From a macro level kanina, ang discussion nyo, uh, pupunta naman tayo ng micro level. Um, very specific um case studies naman ang titignan natin with our three um, speakers. And uh, bago ako mag-proceed sa ating second session, I would like to uh, remind everyone, uh, we have a Q&A box. If you click on more, dun sa baba po ng ating screen, for those who are joining us via Zoom, if you click more, there's a Q&A box. So all your questions can be um, 
input it there. So, pakulit po natin lahat ng questions from the Zoom and also via um, through the comment section ng ating Facebook account. Then we will open the floor again later for um, open forum for, with our uh, with our speakers. At um, the habang kompleto pa po tayong lahat, uh, we would like to request everyone um, to open their videos, kahit saglit lang po, um, for a short photo op. Ay, ice ice na muna. Ice ice na muna. Ice ice po na muna. Ito na ba director, <laughs> please count po. Smile lang po. Another one po, another one. Smile lang. Ayan. Maraming salamat po. Okay. So now we continue the conversation and go to the second session. Um, okay, again, from a macro, we will go to a micro level discussion now with our speakers sharing some stories on local case studies, climate change and COVID-19 related initiatives. So uh, joining us in the panel, Mr. Eric Lopez, who's representing the Calamianes Resilience Network in Northern Palawan. And he has been involved in the community organizing in Puron, Palawan, along with the local government and worked together to ensure the passage of the municipality's local climate change action, action plan. This was mentioned by um, Engineer Lopez from our video. Um, he will share insights from the community-driven case study in Poron, Palawan, under the integrated watershed management project with the local and indigenous communities of Barangay Tara, Buena Vista, and Malawig Ancestral Domain in Coron, Palawan, through the support of 48 Philippines with Forest Foundation Philippines as well. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Edward, Eduardo Mangawang. He is the director of the Regional Climate Change Research and Development Center located at the Visaya State University. He's also a professor and expert in forest resource and management in the university. Um, he has been involved in building the research and extension program of the university in collaboration with local governments around, around the Visayas region, especially in the province of Samar and Leyte. Um, his research interests include local impacts of climate change, slow onset events, including a published work on impacts of sea level rise, increasing sea surface temperature and ocean acidification in Giwan Eastern Samar and Santa Fe Bantayan Island in Cebu, which he will be presenting later on. And last but not the least, Ms. Marjorie Mori Moirong. Um, she is an instructor in the Department of Economics of Ateneo de Manila University. Her areas of specializations include microeconomics, economics of natural resources and the environment, including the application of multi-week CGE or the computable general equilibrium model analysis to examine economic impacts of typhoon, flooding in selected Metro Manila cities. Her most recent research initiative, which she will be presenting later on, is on the rapid rapid situation analysis on the impacts of COVID-19 to MSMEs in Malolos and Paumbong, Bulacan. That may I call on our three speakers, please. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. We have Eric, um, Professor Ed, uh, Ms. Majo with us. Bago tayo magsimula, of course, we'll start with the kamustahan session. Kamusta po kayo? How are you coping with the pandemic? Given that we are all in different areas, Sir Eric in El Nido right now, with Sir Ed in Bye Bye Leyte, and of course, Major here in, in Metro Manila. So how are you all? Sir Eric, let's start with you. I'm doing fine. Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, back home. Uh, um, coping with COVID, uh, mm -hmm. let's do farming. Thank you. Sir Ed, how are you? Okay, dito sa Academia, medyo mahirap because of our, our mm -hmm. learning uh, style uh, online and 
uh, non-online and we have mm-hmm. been uh, engaged with a lot of you know adjustments uh, but it's still uh, proceeding with our uh, research uh, development and extension activity at the center uh, major may constraint or limitation but we still push through with the uh, mm-hmm. activities that we have done before Thank you, sir. See, Sir Ed and of course, Sir Eric, I've been working with them uh, for many years already with our initiatives at the local level. And with Majo, finally, <laughs> nakita na tayo. I can only um, read through our email exchanges when we were building the research last year and now. Um, how are you? Finally, we met na. Well, yeah. Nice meeting you today. <laughs> um, well, it's been very difficult like for most people. I actually just started my PhD studies nung nagkaroon mm-hmm. ng pandemic. I'm, I'm currently on leave from Ateneo from teaching. Uh, so it's difficult mm-hmm. because my part na my isolation, you don't get to see other professors, your, your yeah. students. That's definitely difficult. Yeah. So to be honest, the work with ICSC, Kina Sir Francis, was really helpful because at least mm-hmm. I had some, um, I had a chance to be with people, kahit virtually, and then you know to also help out with the different yeah. initiatives. That, that was really therapeutic in a way, at least for my case. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you for everyone's uh, um, response. Um, for the, n- the next um, discussions with you, we'll be looking into. Um, pre-pandemic research and a current pandemic research. So we will see those dyna- dynamics. No? And I would like to start off by asking everyone, each and every one of you to share highlights of your research initiative. What are the major findings and recommendations? Particularly, um, as we've been discussing a while ago, ano ba yung adaptation measures that are really valuable at the local level? So can we start with you, Sir Eric? Please? Um, thank you, Danica. Good afternoon to mm-hmm. Uh, so the research that uh, I will be uh, presenting is well, was conducted in 2019 as part of mm-hmm. 48 Philippines evaluation of 3R and as a proof of concept for the Green Climate Fund uh, na proposal for Coron and other LGUs. So it was undertaken by, of course, Corn Aid Technical Partner Rain Foundation and, of course, with the Calamianis Resilience Network. So it looked into the effectiveness of 3R. Ano ba itong effect? yung impact and effect of this 3R doon sa development and resilience journey of the three uh, barangays in the municipality of Coron, which was previously presented during the first session. Yeah, so that's the <clears throat> that's the background of the research. Now, uh, we've been talking about 3R and uh, sabi nga natin, ano ba talaga yung 3R na ito? So, but when we say 3R, we're referring to the most ano, uh, precious and finite resources na tubig, no? water. This is very precious and in climate change, napaka, napaka, ano ito? it's either marami or wala or kakonti. So in this context, um, pag sinabi natin tubig or water, uh, sa 3R, ang involved dito is more on the groundwater or the surface water and of course, the rainwater. So pag pinag-usapan natin yung rainwater at saka groundwater, uh, papasok tayo doon sa pag-uusap ng management. So, uh, in terms of rainwater, how do we harvest rainwater para sa immediate and future and long-term benefits that we get from the rainwater? Then, how do we manage our groundwater that is uh, just flowing uh, from the mountains to the sea? So, paano natin siya i-manage to uh, become our resource? And then, of course, what are the ways, the efficient ways of water use para sa basic needs natin and development needs natin, for example, agriculture, household, etc. So, 3R. Okay? <clears throat> so, 3R stands for retention, recharge, and reuse. So, it's a methodology of water buffering. Uh, when you say water buffering, yung pag i ng tubig, to address yung uh, problem natin na uh, most of us is, are facing in the face of climate change, yung scarcity of water, lalo na pag panahon ng uh, dry season. No? So, yun yung uh, recharge, uh, retention, and reuse. So, when we say 3R, sa, yung first R is recharge. Uh, recharge refers to uh, hydrologic process na yung kung saan yung rainwater 
moves downward uh, from becoming a surface water to groundwater. So, ito yung pamamaraan para madagdagan ang reserbang tubig doon sa aquifer natin sa pamamagitan ng pagpapabagal ng takbo ng surface water galing sa tubig ulan. So, yung pamamaraan naman is the most practical way kung anong meron tayo at yung mga indigenous ways na kailangan natin. So, as you can see sa picture natin, so you can see those uh, community members from two different communities. I think the other one's from Tara and the other one's from Malawi. So, they're doing uh, contouring. Uh, naglalagay sila ng mga bato sa dinadaanan ng tubig at saka sa mga slopes. Sa ganun, uh, when the rain comes, the rainwater will have uh, will be slowed down. So after, uh, if you can see, yung, uh, they have uh, been putting uh, stones. So yun yung uh, ginagawa nila. So this is to trap the water so that it goes down uh, sa aquifer natin. So pinapabagal niya yung takbo. So para hindi ma-waste going to the sea. So that's the... Ano, Now, when we talk about retention, it's basically anything that we do to store water. So, depende yan kung ano ang meron sa community or ano yung kalagayan ng komunidad. So, included sa retention, ang mga halimbawa nito are yung mga tanks. No? Tanks, drums, containers, and even bottles. So, paano natin uh, i-retain yung tubig na meron tayo? <clears throat> so, that's retention. So, small scale, bigger scale. Uh, yan. And then when we talk about reuse, so ito yung uh, technology which enable us uh, to recycle yung mga tubig na meron tayo in times of need and scarcity. So reuse is very common practice natin to sa mga household natin, especially during El Nino. So ganun din naman, uh, we also do some reuse sa ating mga backyard garden. Yan. So that's uh, recharge, retention, and reuse. So again, sabi ko nga kanina, as shown in our examples, no, uh, yung 3R application, again, nagbavary yan, depending on the context. So from household level, a uh, garden, sa agricultural areas, even our deep wells, we can also do 3R there. And from the wider uh, landscape, we have watershed areas. And even we can also apply 3R in the entire island just to manage our water resources, the surface water and the rainwater. So that's the information about the 3R. You know? Now, bakit ito relevant? But ito naging adaptation. Now, we we go to ano nga ba yung science? Uh, what what uh, makes this a climate issue? So, alam naman natin yung effect of climate change, especially in, in, in islands or in places where people living in drought-prone areas. Uh, yung climate change and increased incidence of extreme weather events have negative impact sa water security. Yung kakulangan ng tubig, yung 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 pagkakaroon ng tubig, no? So, maraming as as an archipelago, uh, marami tayong mga island communities na talagang talat sa tubig. Especially if you look at yung kanina nga sinasabi ni Ma'am from the uh, Manila Observatory na the general scenario include yung Uh, increased temperature, tapos nagbabary yung quantity and uh, intensity ng mga rainfall patterns and decreased tropical typhoon. No? Ito yung mga frequencies niya tapos yung intensities niya. Now, locally, sa Kalamian, uh, what's alarming in, in, in the CLIRAM uh, report sa data na sinasabi is on the rainfall. So, doon sa CLIRAM, when you look at uh, the area in Palawan which is the northern part, So there's a decrease in rainfall at 25%. So sabi nga ni Ma'am kanina, uh, hindi natin ma-predict but generally uh, dun sa Kliram we have 25% decrease in rainfall. Now pagdating din naman sa mean temperature, tataas siya ng 0.9 to 0.21. Uh, hindi lang sumagad doon sa sinabi ni Ma'am kanina na 2.3. But here it's 0.9 to 2.1. So, ano ibig sabihin nito? So, uh, mas uminit, mas iinit, and mas uh, kukonti yung ulan. So, kung ikaw ay nakatira sa isang island where uh, hirap ka na sa tubig, especially during dry season, and you have this kind of uh, climate scenarios, napaka, napaka hirap 
napaka-green ng ng future na nakikita natin. So, paano pa yung development and paano tayo pupunta sa resilience? So, given the projections, uh, water availability remains a great challenge for these communities and this is where water buffering through 3R is very much important. And uh, doon nga sa areas where this uh, technology was applied, uh, kitang-kita natin yung kasalatan nila sa tubig, yung kahir kahirapan nila sa tubig. So, ano ba yung pinapresent ng 3R. So, doon sa scenario ng ganon. Sabi nga dito sa research, it, uh, it is uh, an alternative concept in storing water in many smaller systems and storing water in a landscape, either underground, uh, sa aquifer, or in small surface systems, or as soil moisture. Hindi lang siya yung, you store, you, you help the water go down sa aquifer, uh, but also, uh, kung titingnan natin, how do we keep the soil moisture is also another uh, way of doing 3R. So it's a powerful approach to cope with the increasing uncertainty in water availability due to climate change. Tapos, dagdagan pa natin yung population natin dumadami and land degradation. So in the context of Coron, uh, in general, no, uh, hindi lang siya local population ang dumadami. But this is a tourist destination and therefore, every year, nag increase yung, yung tourist arrivals. So, yung pressure talaga sa water as a commodity, as as as, uh, as uh, need, uh, nadadagdagan. So, yon. Now, 3R also helps in managing floods and then preventing soil erosion and uh, paano nga yung uh, efficient use ng rainfall. So, this this these things, ito yung sinasabi nating uh, bucket shooting adaptation and uh, how how do we go to the resilience uh, journey? Now, ano ba yung mga significant gains? Kasi nga sabi nga kanina din natin sa this study is a very micro. So, isa lang din sa nakitang mga findings, unang-una is yung at first, hirap na hirap yung mga tao sa tubig. Kasi there some of them are uh, living on the islands, some are in the coastal areas. So, Tapos mahirap pa yung transportation. So common yung paggamit ng pump boat. No? So yung iba, pupunta, nagbabangka, pupunta sa isang neighboring barangay to buy water. And others are going to the other areas where there's an available water para sa kanilang domestic consumption. So in short, um, bumibili sila ng tubig. Or kung hindi man sila bumibili ng tubig, they're using money to spend for gas. Uh, just to go and, uh, and fetch water. So, medyo nagbago yung nangyari nung ginawa natin yung 3R. So, yon Isa sa mga findings yun. Uh, they, they no longer need to buy water or buy gasoline to have water from neighboring villages pag panahon ng dry season. And then, uh, isa sa major uh, na lumabas when uh, the evaluation was conducted is that before they used to have na, shortage of water during the dry season, ngayon uh, ano na hindi na sila kinakapos. Meron ng dalawang summer ang dumaan and happy to say that uh, the, the communities have plentiful water now. So and uh, sa ngayon through the project then uh, from pagigib sa malayo ngayon uh, we're working na nag start na yung level three. Uh, level 3 uh, water system uh, access sa kanila. Now, sig other significant find findings then is, of course, related sa climate change. Dahil nga uh, uh, kinakailangan nating tulungan yung tubig buwaba. No? So, 3R solutions reduce climate change, reduce pressures on land and water resources. Ano yung sabihin nito? So, uh, dahil pag pinag-usapan natin yung water, hindi natin pwedeng uh, iwa iwasan at harapin yung usapin ng environment. No? So, uh, of course, we know that our IP communities are, are stewards of our uh, environment and uh, mas lalo pa silang nahasa doon sa pangalaga ng kanilang uh, ecosystem. So, uh, in terms of management and restoration of their ecosystem, dahil kinakailangan nating tulungan yung tubig kung mailalim, so kinakailangan nating magkaroon ng tree planting, 
tapos ayusin yung mga uh, landscape nila and uh, this one uh, helped in, in, in reducing the pressure. It also provided sufficient water during dry season. So may improve water and water level access and then allowed people to take more control over their own resources and look at water resources in a very positive way. So that is, syempre, pag sinabi natin kabundukan, ang, the idea is mga so kumuha ng mga goods there, uh, cut the timber, no? But now, uh, yung bundok na yan, sagrado, dahil nandyan yung tubig, uh, nandyan yung bundok, and this is a watershed area, and we have to respect that, and uh, kailangan natin tulungang mabuhay ang uh, environment. So, yun, uh, naging, naging mas, mas uh, malalim pa ang pagtingin doon sa ecosystem. Then, of course, uh, when we say people are taking more control of their own resources and system, uh, syempre, pinag-usapan natin yung management ng tubig. So, kinakailangan din gumawa ng mga paraan uh, para doon sa, for example, yung bawasa. No? Uh, yung Barangay uh, Water and uh, Sanitation Association. So, it's also very empowering to them when they're the ones doing all their policies, their guidelines. And they're the ones uh, mobilizing each other para tulungan mabuo yung organisasyon na sa ganun, may mga laga ng distribution ng tubig and may malikom na pera para gamitin para doon sa maintenance ng bawasa and of course, pang share din doon sa gagawin, pang maintain sa kanilang ginagawa sa 3R and the watershed. So yun. And uh, sa ngayon, nagiging conscious na rin sila that we can we can use rainwater. So, pwede natin gamitin pala yung bubunga natin para din makakuha ng tubig. At sa ganun, hindi na rin tayo masyadong umaasa pa sa, sa iba pang sources. No? Pagdating ng tag-ulan. And, uh, of course, ang isa rin sa economic returns nito, hindi lang yung nakatipid sila doon sa, pamas- sa pambili nila ng tubig or pambili ng gasolina para makaigib. But, uh, dahil uh, most of the jobs, household chores ay ginagawa ng mga kababaihan. So, normally, nanay yung gumagawa, nag-iigib ng tubig kasama yung mga bata. But uh, dahil nga maayos na yung tubig, uh, may, may, may ano na, plenty of water, tapos na, nag-level 3 na din, so nandyan na lang yung tubig. Now, before, the mother used to fetch water malayo, nasa malayong lugar, now they have more time kasi uh, they have more time for their families and most specifically may time din sila para gumawa pa ng other alternative livelihood. So ang isa sa magaling silang gumawa is yung pandan handicraft. So gumagawa sila ng panig and we also help them do uh, handicraft na uh, bayong or bags and other stuff. And uh, yeah, they have more time to do that and they're earning money out of that. And that's because they can save time and they have a lot of uh, available uh, uh, time dahil hindi na sila umigib and uh, gumagawa ng paglalaban nila sa, sa labas. No? So yun yung mga significant findings ng study. In terms of sustainability naman, uh, part ng project na ginawa is yung pagkakaroon ng, of course, napaka-importante dito yung pulisiya. So, pagkakaroon ng pulisiya, paano i-manage yung watershed? No? Uh, kasama na rin doon sa pulisiya yun, yung uh, pagmamanage, pagmamaintain ng mga 3R initiatives na ginawa. So, sa policy na yun, una, ginawa lang yon ng community kasama yung indigenous people's organization. Now, we also involve the barangay. So, community, sumama yung barangay, sumama yung IPO, at gumawa sila ng katutubong pulisiya para i-manage yung kanilang watershed. Yun yung napakagandang nangyari. And hindi lang nag-stop doon, kasi yung pulisiya yun, in ng barangay at naging ordinansa. Now, on the part of IPO, dahil may governance system din sila na indigenous, yung kung sa barangay ay ginawa at in sa as resolution, naging ordinansa, sa part naman ng katutubo, it, it was included in their 
at CPT or yung Ancestral Domain Sustainable Development Plan, no? Uh, Development and Protection Plan. So, mas naging uh, ano yan, naigting or 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 mas mas naging konkreto. So, hindi na lang siya dati, baga pagdating sa tree planting, meron lang pupunta doon uh, or may may order lang na sasabihin, let's do tree planting but now since it has become a local ordinance and part of the ads TPP. So, medyo na, mas naging ang sila doon. So, that's one. Now, another one is, of course, kailangan i-maintain yung mga infrastructure. Kailangan i-maintain yung mga ginawa nilang mga uh, uh, pagbubutas, pagkakanal, pag, uh, pag, uh, pagsasalansa ng mga bato, and other other technologies na ginagawa nila. So, kailangan din natin ng financial uh, support. So, ang ginawa naman doon para sa sustainability is um, lahat ng livelihood groups na nandun sa barangay, including Bawasa, yung women's group na nagbibigasan, yung women's group na nagbabayong, yung grupo ng mga magsasaka, eh, they, they come together and uh, sabi nila, lahat ng malilikom nilang pera, part of that, like 5%, some are 10%, will go to the Watershed Management Committee. So, nagbuo ng Watershed Management Committee composed of the different organizations, uh, POs, na nandun sa barangay, plus the barangay and the IP organization, uh, sila yung bumuo ng Watershed Management Committee. Dahil nga sa pangangailangan na i-maintain, nabuo yung uh, konsepto na kailangan lahat ay magbigay. So, nandyan din yung support, of course, ng LGU. No? So, lahat ay magbigay and dahil doon sa pagbibigay niya, kinakailangan gumawa ulit ang pulisiya. So, automatically, nakagawa sila ng payment for ecosystem services na pulisiya. And ang maganda pa rin dito, yung payment for ecosystem services na policy ay in-incorporate pa rin at in-adapt pa rin ang barangay. So, yun. Now, comes, here comes the LGU. Of course, LGU Coron is very much supportive din sa, sa project. Ang ginagawa naman nito is dahil nga sa success na nangyari dito, uh, Coron LGU is now uh, trying to have this program in the pipeline to replicate the 3R in all other barangays. Kasi nga napaka, napakahirap ng tubig sa Coron and in other parts of Calamian pagdating ng summer. Yun. So in terms of, of uh, advocacy and sustainability, uh, yun yung ginagawang part ng koron. And at the same time, uh, we're also working, the Calamianist Resilience Network is also working with Koron LGU to have a Watershed Management Council. Kung sa barangay, we have the Watershed Management Committee. Sa LGU level naman, we're trying to have a Watershed Management Council para uh, matugunan yung pangangailangan ng mga watershed. Kasi sabi nga natin, uh, even, I think this applies to even in Metro Manila, no? Uh, everyone benefits from the water na nanggagaling sa kabundukan natin. Uh, pero, kung lumingon tayo, sino ba ang nagmamanage ng ating watershed? Sino ba ang nangangalaga ng watershed natin? Well, we can say that by the law, we have our national government agencies na dapat mga laga. But look what happened just recently with the series of typhoons uh, especially dyan sa Metro Manila, in Marikina. No? So, doon naman na buhay na, o nga, napapabayaan na natin yung watershed. So, uh, pag, sa pagkakaroon ng Watershed Management Council, na ginaya yung Watershed Management Committee na nandun sa baba, we brought this up sa municipal level, uh, hopefully, uh, yung, yung water security na hadlang sa resilience building ng tatlong komunidad, is maging way din yun para mas mas ano, mas uh, dumami pa. I mean, all the barangays will have sufficient water. And then, of course, uh, we have the uh, Calamianis Resilience Network. <laughs> so, the CRN. So, ano naman yung ginagawa ng CRN para dito sa sustainability and advocacy? So, CRN is also helping not just Coron, but the three other LGUs ng ng, ng Kalamian. So we have Kulyon, Dinapakan, and Buswanga. And we are 
popularizing as well yung uh, uh, what's this uh, 3R practice no mm-hmm. so we're into watershed management so isa sa main na ginagawa kasi yun nga resilience building and the main uh, challenge for resilience building in in our place is is the uh, that's this the water problem no so kahit saan ka maputang munisipyo yun talaga yung sasabihin sa ng mga tao ng munisipyo so that's also where we're looking at uh, the 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 ang ang solution is on the watershed now when we do watershed we automatically incorporate 3R so now CRN uh, is is looking for different resources and venues to popularize 3R and of course to get also funding from from uh, different agencies uh, para mas ma-promote yun. So baka meron kayong uh, mga opportunities dyan. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome to that. And we are also willing mm-hmm. to share uh, information about those things. Mm-hmm. So and lastly, of course, uh, part pa rin ng ginagawang ano, uh, popularization and focusing on uh, 3R as climate adaptation is ito yung nilalaman ng GCF proposal ng Coron and uh, sana kung ma-approve yun, uh, mas magiging malawak, mas masusuportahan yung LGU uh, doon sa pagpapa-adapt noon ng uh, gawain na yan. So that's, I think, the gist of, of the research, Danica. Salamat, Eric. That was really very inspiring. Pwede na natin yung nasa um, comment section and they're, they're really inspired from, ano, from your stories. And kung itignan natin when we talk about Coron Palawan, first thing that comes into our mind is the a top tourist destination in the Philippines that I myself, nung pumunta ako doon, I thought it's only the tourism industry that's really affected by climate. But through the workshops that we've been doing and your presentation of the 3R when we were there, kita namin na, ah, it's really a whole um, water water issue that we need to be facing. And that's for the forestry and also for uh, for the agriculture sector. At nakita natin yung um, drive ng ating um, indigenous people for the common and additional knowledge para dito sa ating adaptation strategy. And with that, um, but punta naman tayo sa isang, isang side ng ating um, ng, ng Pilipinas. Going to uh, discuss also with water, no? Water issue pa rin, water-related, mm-hmm. oceans and marine with Sir Ed yeah. for, our, um, for our research on slow onset events at in Giwan and in Bantayan, ay, in Bantayan Island. So, sir, yeah. please, um, yeah. can you give us a brief, brief background of our research po? Yes, salamat. Uh, good afternoon sa lahat. Uh, uh, especially kay Sir Ino, yung teacher ko sa staff. <laughs> At kay Ma'am Laura. Uh, actually, the, <laughs> this is a very short research that we did with my uh, marine expert uh, team, uh, June Montes and Seni Cesar with the participation of one uh, newly graduated DS uh, in uh, Marine, Akim. Uh, because I'm a forester, I'm not really a legitimate uh, marine expert, but uh, I just coordinated the, the undertaking. It's basically looking at uh, the occurrences of three SOEs. Naman, ano? uh, it's sea level rise, uh, sea surface temperature, and, and uh, ocean acidification. Napakaganda ng opportunity because I for one, uh, yung tumating itong project with uh, ICSC and Accord 8, no? salamat pala sa support, ay bago ito sa university even uh, in BSU. Uh, probably yeah, in, the, in the whole of Eastern Bias. No? In fact, when we went to the sites, eh, they don't understand about SOEs and even itong tinatawag na ocean acidification. Uh, nagiging acidic pala yung dagat. But anyway, uh, this is actually the aim of the uh, very short study is uh, looking at collection of uh, localized uh, information on sea level rise and uh, sea surface temperature as well as ocean acidification uh, as a, for a way of validating no, yung mga uh, generated information and projections made on the basis of satellite 
observations. No? So again, using uh, localized data gathered through actual uh, site ground uh, measurements. So we did very challenging yung processes na ginawa namin. Uh, we had the uh, established, uh, of course, partnership with the local government unit at the uh, municipal, as well as the barangay level. Uh, and then we did a sort of an orientation, which is very uh, important in uh, establishing partnership with uh, local communities. And uh, eventually we were able to form a, a sort of a local research team no? uh, yeah, and, uh, with the support of the local government officials and did a very short training on the ground or on site. Uh, we were able to uh, select potential no? uh, data collectors uh, who are uh, obviously future folks uh, in all of these sites in uh, Giwan, uh, particularly in uh, Barangay Campuyong in Trinidad Island and in Sulangan. And in uh, Bantayan Island, it's in Santa Fe, no? uh, a resort uh, uh, very popular for uh, ecotourism. Okay. So what we did uh, is to train them. And then the challenge is really to uh, establish the tidal gauges, which we fabricated. You know? It's some sort of a PBC type. Uh, we fabricated it at BSU. And it's being utilized you know, by laboratory students in, in marine science here at BSU. So it's already tested you now. And uh, there, there was a sort of a 24-hour uh, data collection uh, from 2018 to 2019, you know, which we did uh, twice a month, every 15th and 30th uh, of every month. Uh, and then we also have a special collection during full and new moon, when according to the locals, the sea level uh, is uh, high. So what we did was, uh, in the local data collection, it's basically remote. No? We tend to communicate with the local data collectors uh, with the use of cell phones. We provided them with the support and then uh, a bit of compensation for their labor uh, and participation. Uh, and then afterwards, we shared the results uh, to the key decision makers at the local government units uh, at the municipal level particularly the LGU Council. So uh, let me present you very briefly uh, yung resulta ng, So the in situ observation uh, we did from October 2018 to January of 2019 generally show an increasing trend in the monthly mean tide uh, height levels, uh, which is approximating the uh, satellite observations and projections of NOAA. Uh, the in situ recorded observations, although insufficient, no, kasi medyo maigsi yung panahon. Uh, in fact, in our recommendation, mas, mas maganda kung magkaroon ng follow through. Uh, although insufficient in number and with low statistical confidence, uh, basically provide an information validating the occurrences of SOEs no, as depicted in the satellite records of NOAA. We also utilize the uh, digitized a record of Namria in both uh, islands and both sites. No? And what we found out is really the localized collect collected data is actually nearing the uh, digitized as well as the global observations. Uh, in as far as sea surface temperature, uh, again, the information is basically uh, consistent no? with this uh, increasing trends uh, as per global uh, uh, measurements. Uh, the in situ recorded mean sea water pH uh, observations uh, in, is nearly acidic. No? Uh, one thing that we found out is probably this has some anthropogenic uh, influence because the uh, installation of uh, tidal gauges is malapit to the coastal uh, area which is nearing the residential areas. Baka yung mga basura or kasi ito ay mga fisher fox, yung kanilang mga waste from uh, fish processing ay doon na itapon o doon dumadaan sa area na may uh, mayroong observation points na in-install the research team. No? 
Uh, some personal views and uh, local participation. Uh, ang engage, the engagement of LGUs and local communities in the conduct of local-based research is an effective approach to gain uh, really local participation. No? Uh, basically, very practical. Uh, it really created better awareness no? and understanding of a given phenomenon, particularly the SOEs. We thought that knowing really by doing uh, themselves provides an opportunity for the locals to actually see and believe. Alam mo naman yung mga locals, eh, my experience in forestry, eh, ang kanilang principle is to see, is to believe. So when you are introducing uh, some sort of a, an improvement in their knowledge, knowledge and practices, you really have to show up. And that's why the demonstration is very important. Ang napakadaling, ang napakagandang nangyari is uh, they really learn and see by themselves the occurrences of these uh, SOEs. And eventually, this triggered local interest to participate. No, uh, medyo ginanahan na. Sa una, may, medyo apprehensive sila, lalo na yung mga local data collectors. But when they found out that it's really uh, providing uh, very important uh, information for their livelihood and survival, medyo ginanahan na silang mag-participate. Mag, uh, uh, one, one challenge lang dito is uh, really uh, simplifying and customizing research approach. Uh, at a level that the locals can understand also and, and do. No? Uh, kasi if we, uh, oftentimes yung uh, methodology, uh, research methodology, eh, medyo mahirap na hindi ma-i-adapt ng ating mga local, uh, potential local researchers. Uh, what have been the challenges and opportunities? Uh, of course, uh, during this pandemic, no, na luna, yung limitation in actual visits and interpersonal connection. In fact, my center planned to really continue the SOE uh, undertaking kasi maraming nag-demand na LGUs, particularly dun sa PBC, uh, yung improvised PBC, para daw malaman din nila kung tumataas ba tala o tumaas na yung kanilang uh, kasi marami daw uh, symptoms or evidences na nag, uh, na lang naging significant yung uh, level rise. Um, holding of on-site demonstration and sharing is constrained also, so mahirap. But uh, it, it did not really constrain us. Uh, uh, what we're doing is online na lang. No? Uh, we're developing uh, here at the center some sort of modules uh, so that we can also deliver. And yung mga ano, uh, copies of uh, PowerPoint presentations, uh, basically, uh, para mag, 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 magkaroon din sila ng basis uh, and, and, and uh, material to see. No? Ano yung naging opportunities, uh, lalo na ngayong pandemic? Uh, yung online platform is, uh, has really brought opportunities no, to reach a wider number of LGUs and communities. Na-present ko tong study na ito. Eh. Uh, malawak uh, at the barangay, at the municipal, provincial, and even internationally. Eh. Uh, yan, uh, medyo maganda yung impact niya din sa uh, prestige ng university. Uh, it, the, one opportunity is it created a sort of a challenge no, for us to, be, to innovate. Nag-isip kami ng mga para-paraan na uh, kahit pandemic ay maipahagi pa rin yung uh, aming uh, natutunan no, dito sa uh, napakagandang research na ginawa namin. Uh, what's the relevance of local research in the local policy and development? It created more reliable and site-specific science-based basis no? na magagamit ng uh, local uh, LGUs, no? ng, uh, local government units, na yun ang actual sitwasyon ng kanilang lugar, uh, yun ang lumabas na information, and therefore malaki yung confidence nila na uh, makakakreate sila ng tamang at discourse and, and actions na tutugma doon sa findings uh, base sa uh, study. Ano ba yung mga support needs for local participatory research? Uh, we have to really continue no, yung knowledge and capacity development. Particularly of the, uh, our local potential uh, researchers. Sa Eastern Samar, maraming youth even who are professionals na willing uh, mag-form into group particularly doing research and partner with academic institutions like DSU. Uh, itong opportunities for funding support uh, usually eh, nahihirapan ng locals. And so what we are intending is to do is to connect them. No? Yung sinabi kanina ni uh, Sir Sinwen Sakoron, merong UNEP 
uh, window, kaya lang tapos na yung deadline, uh, supporting itong uh, local uh, initiatives uh, for climate change adaptation na uh, siguro nakita nyo rin yan. Ano? Uh, pero mag-open uli yan. Malaki din yung support nila. And then, dapat magkaroon tayo ng continuing technical support. Uh, particularly part, in partnership with the academy, with the local governments and uh, research and development agencies. Kailangan, kailangan bumaba doon sa local communities. Uh, napakagandang uh, impact nito uh, na marirealize when you really go down to the local communities. So ano ba yung naging value of these local studies? Uh, of course, yung enhancement of local capacities and collaboration. Uh, this study actually served as a platform for local people to understand, even have a grasp of the national and global phenomena about slow onset event in sea level rise. Totoo pala yun na nangyayari kasi nakakita sila ng evidence doon sa kanilang lugar. It also provided the concrete local evidences and basis in validating these national and, and local findings. No? Uh, and then it triggered local communities' uh, commitment and participation for local policies and actions. Sabi nila, doon sa ilang tagaan, oops, we really have to do something or else we die. <laughs> uh, it also, uh, in the formulation of science uh, and evidence-based policies and plans at the local and global, uh, magandang basis itong local uh, information. Uh, because we can take into account yung variations uh, in local biophysical and social economic environment. Iba-iba eh. And probably different sites would really uh, demand different uh, styles or strategies for SOE adaptations and, and mitigation. No? Uh, yung information from actual local but varying situations will provide reliable basis in making generalizations about the actual SOE situation at the national and probably further at the global level. Uh, local and science-based information uh, provide highly confident guide. Uh, kasi local base eh, in the formulation of policies and implementation of plans that will be responsive really to the adaptation and mitigation needs of our uh, vulnerable local communities. No? Uh, so yun lang siguro ang aking mai-share, no? Yes. Uh, bye now. Thank you. Salamat, Sir Ed. Um, I think very important yung, yung, yung um, transfer of knowledge and support to the community. In that way, may intindihan nila lalo ito. Very technical indeed, ang slow onset events when we look at it at the first glance. Pero when we go at the ground at ipinaintindi talaga natin sa kanila, they really appreciate it. And I think that's what transcribed from the research also. And even pati, actually nga, um, Giwan, for instance, um, dahil ginawa itong research after they formulated their uh, climate change adaptation framework and their LCCAP, um, they're in the process of enhancing and already incorporating nga po yung ano, findings ng research. Yep. That's very important also. Um, okay, uh, so we have Sir, Sir Eric and Sir Ed, no? And now we move to uh, Ms. Majo to discuss oh. naman. Ano ba yung ano? Let's go to a current uh, current uh, research naman. Um, looking at um, understanding the, uh, the COVID-19 impacts to the local economy of Bulacan. Paumbong particularly is also a coastal area, di ba? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we will see also um, its impact dun sa kanilang resilience building. Um, Maja, please, can you um, share to us some of the highlights of the research? Cool. Oh. Yung project actually with Sir Francis de la Cruz, itong rapid situation analysis, is an offshoot of a project of ICSC sa coastal areas ng Bulacan facing Manila Bay. So yung maraming ang fish ponds, yung coastal areas. Uh, like yung projects ni Sir Ed and, if, uh, and ni Sir Eric. But then, early, so early last year, nagsustart na si ICSC na um, with the resilience planning with this coastal areas para sana maka-help mag-mitigate ng sea level rise and potential flooding, coastal flooding no, sa mga fish ponds especially. But then, yun nga, the pandemic struck and suddenly yung group uh, partners for resilience, so that includes ICSC, uh, 
Cord Aid and yung Malolos Diocese Commission on Social Action, thought na baka dapat kailangan nilang mag-respond dun sa need ng kanilang partner communities at that point in time. So, sa kwento ni Sir Francis, they started with the distribution of hygiene kits before finally reaching out, trying to reach out to, 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 to someone or to a group na kami ngayon to help them assess naman the impacts of um, COVID-19 on the local economy because suddenly they realized na yun yung problema at that particular point in time. And nandun din nakafocus yung, yung concerns ng mga tao and obviously, in the long run, if you know, we'd want to more effectively um, respond to the climate crisis, we need to understand how COVID-19 pandemic had affected and continues to affect the socioeconomic aspect of our lives. So understanding the COVID-19 impacts of the Bulacan economy definitely seemed very warranted at that time last year. Uh, yung economy ng Bulacan um, is comprise a lot, karamihan MSMEs, so may mga fish ponds, pero like, just like with any most provinces, most cities, maraming retailers, maraming shops, maraming services shops, so mostly MSMEs, small businesses. They were doing okay, uh, we'd say that the local economy is very dynamic, strong intralinkages, so for instance, si Paumbong at si Malolos, parang isang economy na lang din yan, yung mga katabi rin nila na, na towns. Uh, they also have strong linkages with Metro Manila. But then, nangyari nga yung pandemic, so suddenly, um, may mobility constraints, uh, suddenly hindi na makaalabas yung mga tao, and we were dealing with that public health emergency. So the, the so quickly, the key takeaway, the key findings uh, were that, yun nga, suddenly, hindi dahil sa, dahil sa, pandemic, hindi na makalabas yung mga tao. There is reduced food traffic, uh, walang, walang students, and hence people could not go out. Nabawasan yung kita ng mga firms, lahat for most types of firms. But another key finding was that ang pinaka-resilient sa pandemic, hindi sa climate change, sa pandemic, was actually the aquaculture sector. Kasi pwede ka pa rin mag- uh, mag, mag-operate, they're able to continue their operations as long as the uh, they were very responsive to the protocols set up by the local local government. So, tuloy-tuloy lang yung kanilang sales, tuloy-tuloy lang yung kanilang production. So, in uh, just to conclude this first part, yung key takeaway is that the policy response in these two new normals, we believe, would be threefold. So, nandiyan yung health, and yung economic recovery, yung short term. But definitely, we have to always include yung long-term resilience to different types of crisis, which is also something na sinasabi or pinupoint out ng ating unang panel. So, I guess this is something I could explain a bit more later as we go to the specific mechanisms that we saw in the Bulacan study. Salamat, Ms. Majo. I think that's very important as well to look at the socioeconomic aspect din. Ang impacts nga ng pandemic and looking at a long-term resilience building din. Um, lalo na very particular on health, even in climate, in the climate um, context in general. Parang emerging ano pa rin din siya study for now. And I think that's also good. Um, in the future, we will see if there's already a link with um, COVID and and climate change. Because for now, um, scientists are really very careful in making that link. Because we can't do the link. Na yun. But we will see in the future with more research on the ground, more studies, and even um, proof of concepts, we will see what are the possible, whether it's a direct or indirect link, and how it's been, been affecting um, the communities in general. And I think for the three research, we will, see, we will see the common denominator of a participatory research. And that's very important, lalo na pag nasa locality. And dun talaga tayo, ano eh, pinupokok eh, na it should be participatory because of uh, we want that all possible sectors to be involved in the research, in the study, and also the ownership of the research should be um, geared towards the localities. And that's very important. No, um, What do you think in terms of um, participatory research. Ano pa kaya yung gaps and challenges, whether um, through your experiences on this particular research and even in um, your um, experiences in other research? Um, can I start with uh, Sir Eric? Hi, thanks, Danica. So, sa research, uh, well, ang 
initial na research na ginawa is really more of qualitative, no? Uh, mm-hmm. Evaluation type or assessment type uh, based lang doon sa narrative. Of course, we cannot deny na nadagdagan din naman talaga yung tubig at napa- napaayos yung system na, na, na papunta. Mas, mas naging green ang kanilang bundok. Uh, mas nagkaroon ng sistema. Mas naging malinis yung tubig na iinom nila. But in terms of, siguro, uh, when we talk about replication of this uh, 3R para mas mabilis yung buy-in, uh, baka may, may mga quant- quantitative research na pwedeng gawin on the uh, hydrology, parang sort of hydrology study on how it it uh, builds up, I mean, yung, yung the process ng, ng recharge, gano'n. So, yun yung una, no? Tapos, uh, isa sa challenge din, siguro, is yung, kasi, doing the 3R, as you can see in the pictures na pinakita kanina, uh, napakaganda kasi sa, sa isang IP community, I think, advantage yun, kasi, uh, <clears throat> close knit sila, uh, they're united, no? So, mas madaling mamobilize. So, ang challenge for application pagdating sa sa ibang lugar is kasi it's a community initiative. Lahat ng gumagawa doon uh, ay community. no So, sila ang nag-training, sila ang nag-educate sa mga kasama nila, sila rin yung gumagawa. Uh, at itong ganitong pamamaraan is medyo mahirap for in other areas na hindi uh medyo hindi solid no so parang the, the the strong community involvement is critical and how do you get that strong community involvement kung medyo diverse yung ano uh yun and then lastly siguro yung how do you link in a most practical way yung climate science into the <clears throat> needs and context ng community kasi ito yung naging daan din, nag-facilitate ng uh, mobilization. Uh, Siyempre, kung dadalhin mo sa kanila yung, yung mga technicalities uh, nung mga researches na yung kagaya na banggit kanina sa first part, medyo mahirap nilang maintindihan. Uh, but if you uh, look at their issues, social issues, and link that to the climate science sa mga data na meron tayo, mas mas madali nilang maintindihan at mas madali silang makagawa ng paraan para umaksyon or, or i-manage yung kinakailangan nilang uh, proseso para sa community. Salamat, Eric. Um, this question was for Miss um, Majo naman. Um, you've mentioned um, the three... Uh, um, three, the key takeaways or the threefold um, takeaways from the research, you no know, health recovery and resilience. Can you um, discuss more about this in details? Um, uh, any key takeaways, lessons that can be replicated and of course upscaled, especially that we're in, we're facing a, a another new normal indeed. Miss Maja. Oh, you. When, when we were doing this research, maybe a bit of mm-hmm. backstory about this uh, particular project. Actually, yung research team na namin yun na Sir Francis is composed of mm-hmm. two teams. So, meron kaming group ako with two other MA students from Ateneo. And then, si Sir Francis had to look for people who were willing to go down dun sa field, do the field work. Um, so parang ang nangyari sa aming strategy to make it participatory because it need to be participatory research was um, mixed method. So meron kaming nag-desk research kami, kami yung gumawa mm-hmm. ng instrument for the survey. And then sina Sir Francis, together with the local government, uh, may mga LGU staff na tumulong. Sila yung nag interview naman dun sa mga MSM respondents. And so in terms of you know, making it participatory, making it local, Yung key takeaways came from um, trying to understand the specific mechanisms kung paano nakaapekto yung COVID-19 dun sa buhay ng mga tao, specifically dun sa economic lives nila. So definitely number one for the case of, of, of uh, Bulacan, we saw na 
lalo yung mga aquaculture sector kasi pwede naman talaga silang mag-operate, di ba? Pero biglang maraming bawal daw ito, kailangan may ganito. So they had to coordinate with the local government unit to um re- to, to figure out anong klasing of protocols yung magwo-work for, for for them. Kasi doon sa bagsakan ng isda, parang ang hirap. Ano daw doon eh kasi pag uh, mag-auction ng isda, bulungan, bawal na yung bulungan. So they had to make a way na papel na lang, sulat na lang, tapos nandun yung kung sino yung pinakamataas na builder, saan niya mapupunta. So there were discussions and I think Bulacan's experience, they were mostly successful in that. Um, that's the first, so that's the health response. The other thing, that we also recommended sana sa Bulacan to, to tap yung existing um, structures already there referring to the cooperative movement which has been very um, strong since the 90s. I think kalala naman ng Bulacan dyan sa cooperative movement na yan. And sana, di ba, kung nandiyan na sila, ang kailangan natin aside from the health response would be the recovery measures for MSMEs and households. Um, nagsimula na kasi yung mga yung kababa, yung Kanyogan Cooperative, St. Francis Cooperative, they were very helpful with providing loans, very helpful with allowing people not to pay muna. So may reduce collections, sure. Pero they were, they were very understanding of the situation. So kung ganun, may solidarity to begin with. Why not tap them for other strategies na makakatulong sa MSME? So kanina na pag-uusapan yung microinsurance, for 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 agriculture baka kailangan din siya for maybe for aquaculture for some other types of MSMEs talaga kailangan din nila ng insurance um and the possibility of using this micro uh, partnering with these cooperatives to help the people shift towards e-commerce kung sabi ng mga experts kailangan mag-shift tayo sa digitalization um finally we urge the local governments not just in Bulacan but everywhere else to try to help you no know, build Um, a local economy that is more resilient. Kasi nga, hindi lang resilient, but also sustainable. Kasi nga, sabi, di ba, findings namin, pinaka-resilient yung aquacultural sector. Kasi kaya nilang mag-operate pa rin. But we know, ICSC studies, that they are the most heavily threatened by, by climate change issues. So, anong ibig sabihin nun? What does that mean for the economy, for the, for the climate at the same time? Ano yung... Um, growth or economy uh, environment natural resources nexus na kailangan natin pag-usapan kailangan natin i-rethink na sinabi nga ni Doc Toby kanina uh, moving forward Thank you Majo um, Sir Ed Would you like to respond also Sir Ed regarding yeah. um, in sense of um, uh, importance yeah. of um, gaps or participatory challenges. research and the gaps yeah. Yes sir Uh, actually, one thing is yung research kasi is quite short. Mm-hmm. Kung mas maganda siguro if we have uh, uh, widen the time so that we can mm-hmm. be able to arrive at. And then covering more areas. Uh, if given enough time, we can cover more areas. Uh, yung, yung adjacent doon sa sites ng, ng Giwan so that we can build a higher level of confidence in terms of the findings of the study. Ang magandang inisip namin noon ay dapat na isama natin yung uh, condition ng biodiversity, uh, yung coastal and marine biodiversity uh, other than the SOS. Kasi sabi nga ni Dr. Laura kanina, yun ang mga uh, importanting uh, ecosystems na pinanggagalingan ng kabuhayan ng mga fisher fox. At pag naipakita kasi natin yun sa tao na ang epekto nitong sea surface temperature or uh, sea level rise ay nasisira ang ating ano. So para ma-consider na nila when they make you know, uh, plans or policies or, or programs na ma-consider din, not necessarily on the SO, on uh, SLR but uh, uh, saving or you know, restoring or rehabilitating uh, itong um, ecosystems uh, severely affected by the, the SOEs. No? Uh, yung local participation, ang isa lang naman problema, yung change ng administration, which is usual. Uh, almost uh, always ito yung nagiging problema. Uh, kasi forester ako sa watershed uh, rehabilitation projects, ito rin yung naging problema. Eh. Uh, 
it's not basically nagiging uh, uh, ang tawag dito uh, undertaking or obligation ng political leaders na nagiging politicized o no, politicized no so ito yung isang nakikita kong uh, challenge but you know kung strong ang tao natin sa uh, local communities uh, i think uh, magiging resilient sila against itong mga politicizing ng <laughs> uh, political leaders eh. uh, isa yan sa uh, nakikita tapos na, para maipaliwanag din ano yung sort of uh, more in more detail yung ano ba yung naging uh, magiging effect in, in the in the future uh, severe effect nitong SOE sa kanilang specific livelihood uh, uh, undertakings uh, lalo na doon sa Santa Fe no ang projection ko doon ay yung mga coastal resorts ay mawawala kasi meron na tayong evidence eh, uh, na ipakita yata ron sa picture kanina uh, saan pupunta ito uh, tapos meron tong connection again doon sa kanilang relocation programs uh, dito sa lugar na ito. Ilang tagaan uh, yung water level, sea water level, umabot na rin sa terrestrial area. Kasi nakakita ako ng isang species ng puno. Hindi naman siya beach forest. Nasa upland na siya. So ito yung mga evidences na pwedeng pagtuunan ng uh, additional uh, focus when we Uh, replicate uh, this kind of research sa uh, other areas. Sana matuloy yung sa Leyte Gulf, napaka-interesting nun. Because it will really be very, very uh, significant with the high impact covering all these municipalities uh, and probably cities in the Leyte Gulf area. Thank you, sir. Um, let's move a little bit general naman. So when we were discussing, even from the first session, there should be science and evidence-driven local policy development. And ang laging tanong is, even when we say it policy um, decision and policy making, there's always a, um, a question of whether ano ba yung best possible data or information that the community and the local government can start with in terms of um, deciding on what would be their climate adaptation initiatives at the local level, their strategies. No? Based on your experience, sir, uh, sir and um, Ms. Maggio, no? what are these possible, best possible data or information that you think would be very helpful? Can I start with um, Eric? Okay, so what we did in Koron, uh, what was very helpful was, of course, sabi mo kanina, yung paggamit natin ng CLIRAM results Uh, mm -hmm. tapos nilapat natin doon sa ano problema sa community. So mm -hmm. saan sila saan sila nagtagpo? At kung paano to ipaliliwanag sa tao? <clears throat> so yun, uh, yun lang yun. Now in terms of doon sa cascading yung sa pagpapaliwanag sa tao, what we did in our uh, during the LC Cup. Uh, napakaimportante nung napakaganda nung ginawa nating impact chain analysis, no? So we use the scientific data and then uh, tiningnan natin yung nasan ba yung problema nan ano yung context nila ano yung capacity nila ano yung development needs nila saan sila hinahamon talaga Now sa pagpapaliwanag na yon uh, it's important to have a kind of uh, instrument na makikita din yung yung series na yon uh, And we have that we have shown that through our impact chain analysis. And sabi nga kanina, napaka-importante ng information. Once they have this information, and they know that they know for a fact that uh, ito ay nakaka-affect sa buhay nila at na nararamdaman nila. So napakadali na lang yung mobilize. So yun yun yung take ko dito kung ano yung importante. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sir Eric. So, uh, how about you, Sir, uh, Sir Ed? I think you also um, yeah. used the ICA format for the yeah. research. Uh, Can you expound on this, Sir? Yeah, ang importante sa akin yung time series data. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, ang tinitignan ng magandang ipakita sa tao yung change. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly kung when you talk about SOEs. Uh, kasi kailangan pa natin silang i-convince. Eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kasi bago sa kanila yung termino ng slow onset, meron pala niyan. Uh, yun ano, uh, ipakita natin itong data. Uh, kaya nga sinabi ko, mas maganda yung 
meron ma-sustain yung yung activity. Uh, even by local government units themselves. Kasi kaya nila yan eh. And we just teach them what uh, how to do it. As an analysis, uh, we can also help them. No? We simplify the analysis. Ito yung time series is very important so that they will be able to really monitor. Uh, monitoring is really very important. Eh. Uh, in that kind of monitoring, nakaka-develop sila ng sarili nilang koro-koro uh, or decisions or even actions. How to counter. No? Diyan papasok ang academe. Kung may pangangailangan sila na nakikita nila na weakness nila, then we can enter. Uh, mahirap pangunahan minsan. Uh, alam mo yung uh, uh, attitude minsan ng mga academics. Eh. Uh, palaging silang bida. Siguro ang maganda nun eh, nasa likuran lang. Uh, we just ano, start things to happen and then let the locals uh, continue the work and we just be at the back of, of uh, their undertakings. Eh. So magandang maipakita yung mga time series data. Even yung mga historic data in the past, kung pwedeng ma-recover. Halimbawa, may mangroves ba dyan nung araw? Anong nangyari? Ah, nasaan na siya? Mga ganong tipon. Uh, for, for, the, for this to be realized by the locals na totoo yung mga pangyayari, hindi ito kuro-kuro kundi scientifically uh, proven. Maraming salamat, Sir Ed. Finally, Ms. Majo. Siguro yung sagot ko parang... Um parang lessons or reflections as a Manila-based researcher. Kasi ano naman talaga, parang na-realize namin ng, well, at least yung teammates ko from, from Ateneo na kasi una sabi namin kay Sir Francis, paano po ba natin gagawin to? Hindi tayo basta-basta mga kalabas. Remember that the project is an assessment of COVID-19 during the lockdown. It was um, started talking po parang late July, started August. So, um, Parang in a way, na-realize namin na kailangan talaga type, type, types of information that we need would require na kahit mahirap puntahan yung mga tao. Um, with that said, what we did as a research strategy was mixed uh, because economic yung, yung, yung project. So we use both qualitative and quantitative. Similar din naman to sa mga science-based projects po, di ba? So, we did the survey. We have 184 respondents asking them on different uh, questions. For instance, isa sa mga nakuha naming findings is out of our 184 um, respondents, wait, uh, 52. <laughs> 52 lang daw yung kayang mag-shift to e-commerce. 62 people, respondents don't know if they can shift. Hindi nila alam. Maybe they're not familiar. And then other 62 cannot shift. Kasi ito yung mga drivers, for instance, or yung mga restaurants talaga. So, quantitative, that's that's one type of information that we, got, we tried to gather to the best of our capacity during that time. But the other thing is, si Sir Francis made sure they also... Um, mm -hmm took stories from the local from the local people they talked with the LGUs as well tapos yung part po ng team na nandoon sa project were people from Malolos and Paumbong and so they also understand and under they experience kung ano yung impacts ng COVID-19 um doon sa kanilang province so i guess that's really a lesson for for those of us here in 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 Manila um na we we we, we want to help. We want to understand what's happening. But if we, not just for COVID, but also for, for, for the climate crisis, we really need to go to the communities. Kasi iba-iba yun ang nangyayari. Local problems need local solutions. Um, so it, it's really good na we have this opportunity to you know, talk, ano, talk about the different experiences para we also learn from each other po talaga. Salamat, Majo. And I think uh, before we close this session, no, um, very important na um, somehow na-affirm natin yung mga statements ng ating experts from the earlier session, especially um, with Doc Face um, mentioning that um, there shouldn't be a scale mismatch. And very important yung local uh, participation, participation of the sectors in order to do so with the marrying of the science and the um, indigenous knowledge and also the practices at the local level. Very important that we're not just 
doing research for the sake of doing research, <laughs> but we're also um, using this as a tool for um, policy development, especially at the local level. And hopefully, um, this would be very, um, um, very valuable to scale it up, lalo na pag ginawa naman natin ito as an advocacy at the national and even the bigger regional and international level. Okay, um, maraming salamat sa um, at ating speakers, um, Ms. Majo, Sir Eric, and Sir Ed para sa ating um, session 2. At hindi muna namin kayo papakawalan at tatawagin ko ang, ang aking partner sa webinar na ito, Sir Francis. Open yes. na po natin ang ating um, open forum, open discussion. And we'll be reading some uh, questions also. Good. Uh, salamat sa ating panel. Salamat, Danica. Mm -hmm. Medyo active yung, no, I think we have a very active uh, chat box. Uh, um, for those who are not able to read uh, mm -hmm. the chat box, uh, let me just uh, paraphrase some of the comments. No? Mm -hmm. Yung una, <clears throat> there was a question about how accessible yung uh, ating climate data to the public. I think that was addressed to Dr. Fay. Then there was another comment uh, from uh, Region 8 NEDA. Sabi nila, their problem is uh, the data on AUU fish ponds. I think that's uh, in reaction to what uh, Dr. Laura was uh, discussing. AUU, ibig sabihin po niyan ay abandoned, <laughs> undeveloped, and unproductive uh, fish ponds. Fish Kasi, ponds. Yeah, those fish ponds, uh, mostly, ano yan eh, galing sa mangrove forest, di ba? Yeah. Tapos ginagawang fish ponds. But, but there comes a time na hindi na rin siya productive or na-abandon na. Na dapat sana, mabalik siya dun sa dati niyang... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so yun yung isang tanong ng Taganeda. Uh, there are also some interactions about uh, uh, how uh, institutes like the UPMSI can be tapped. Uh, to support the work in areas like uh, Suluan. Ang sabi naman ni Doc Lara is mag-email lang daw kayo sa kanya. Uh, air, capital LT David at upd.edu.ph <laughs> So, and then there's another question addressed with kay Doc Lara about how to go about yung mangrove reforestation. Ang suggestion lang naman niya ay, ay ang suggestion niya, well, First and foremost is local survey of suitability. Kasi kailangan eksakto yung intervention dun sa... Ano, wag, wag kayong magpapadala dun sa picture taking. <laughs> <laughs> Tapos mali, mali yung lugar, mali yung species, etc. And then there's, there's this other comment. Well, hindi naman siya tanong, but it's a comment. Um, yung uh, magandang case study din po ang nangyari for developing a community of citizen scientists. I just want to highlight that because I think the theme of the panel discussion the panel discussions today is that what we need are citizens who are able to uh, tap or access, understand, and integrate science, the products of scientific research, into our uh, intervention. So hindi, hindi, we don't want to create parang another specialized body. But it, it's really, we need citizens, we need mm -hmm. authorities who are, uh, you know, guided by science. No? Mm -hmm. Data, sabi nga nila, kailangan natin data, hindi dates. Kasi uso ngayon yan eh. Kesa yung, <laughs> kesa yung ebidensya, yung event yung Hindi, hindi ko na papalalimin kung yun, what, what I'm referring to. But uh, you know, I think you know what I mean in this age of social media. Yes, Wait, yes. Pwede ba ikalat din natin na dapat kasama ang climate, uh, pagtugon sa climate crisis sa mga itatanong sa mga tatakbo sa 2022? Hindi ako. Um, Doc Laura, mukhang napaka... Agree po ako doon. <laughs> napaka-bigat ng binitawang binitawan niya yan. Kasi I think, uh, sabi nga, I think it was a recurring theme. Kasi sabi natin, mm -hmm. kailangan, we have to plug into this. We have to plug into the data about yes. these physical shocks, climate crisis, pandem this pandemic, and possible future pandemics. At kailangan, preparado na tayo. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't act on it when it's already in our face which was what happened with COVID. Alam na natin may SARS eh. Alam natin yung MERS, 
MERS CoV, alam na natin yan. Alam na natin yan 2005, no? And yet we did not really uh, I I think we did not pay enough attention. Kaya tayo nag -habon. Anyway, uh, so I, I think are there other questions kasi nila yung nakita ko dito sa ano, mm -hmm. sa chat box. Danica? I think uh, wala na tayong further questions and of course uh, we will invite of course our um, participants if you still have further questions you can always email us through the info at icsc.ngo or directly nga to our speakers kanina naman eh, may mga naglalagay na ng kanilang um, kanya kanya email address and that's um, that's also good no um, but before we formally end talaga um, since nandito pa ang ating mga speakers and we are very thankful ta na andito pa rin kayo hanggang malapit na mag-alas 5. Um, if we could ask um, just one or two sentences the main takeaway for uh, for our for our um, webinar. Can we start with um sige sige uh, talk me let's start with you. Okay. Oh, so I don't need to answer but the question from the chat box. <laughs> no, no. That's okay. Okay. So, um, so what I can just say is that, you know, the issue of climate change is very complex. And so it's, it's not just uh, up to one institution, you know, it, it needs to have a collaborative transdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. so that we can develop effective policies and measures on adaptation and mitigation. And it's important that we continue to pursue the sector and policy relevant scientific research to support the science informed and evidence-based climate action. So the climate change research that we need to do should be able to help us and inform us on what we need to do, where this needs to be done, and how soon. Thank you, Doc Pei. Um, Doc Ina, please. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, uh, as we have mentioned earlier, um, climate change has important effects and impacts on agriculture, and therefore, threatening our food security situation, and even sustainable development. The good thing is there are available uh, climate change adaptation options that we can uh, use and uh, that will make our food production systems more resilient. The second, I mentioned also earlier that the LGUs are actually in the forefront on promotion of these tools and climate change adaptations. And I support the idea of, you know, uh, uh, assessing uh, candidates for positions next uh, uh, understand on uh, how to make uh, the food production systems and the entire community to be more resilient and sustainable. So I hope uh, uh, ICSC can initiate acti activities related to that or we could have uh, some sort of uh, sponsored debate among candidates on selected topics on climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ino. Very interesting po. Dr. Laura. Um, I guess the message is uh, we should look at what we have and make the best of it. So we have two things. We have a really high biodiversity and we should make sure we do everything to keep that because that will keep us above uh, uh, floating, I guess, at least. Kasi kahit na anong pandemya man ang, ang pumasok, uh, kung marami na mga iba-ibang klase yung na kanya-kanyang niche, no? hindi lang singular, we're, we'll be resilient. But the other one, I think, is we should really take advantage of our Gen Z, our next generation. They're really connected and they were forced to even become more connected because of the pandemic. So, um, if we can provide materials for them uh, at their, you know, the way they think, the way they actually consume data, um, I think that will be the best because that network is huge and they can do a lot. Thank you, Doc Laura. And now let's go to our session two speakers, um, Sir Eric. Ah, I'm sorry, um, Ma'am Toby. I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I stepped out and so I'm, I'm just listening. At it's point. okay, ma'am. Can you also share to us um, takeaways? A what? Final takeaways. Final takeaways, ma'am. Can you, can you give me more time to... <laughs>
it's okay, ma'am. No problem. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. yeah no okay. problem, po, ma'am. Thank you. I'll be, we'll go to Sir Eric. Are you still there? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, siguro, sabi nga natin yung sa all about resilience, adaptation. Mm -hmm. I think the, the road to resilience is for, for everyone coming up together. Uh, mobilization ng LGUs, NGAs, communities, academic institutions, research, civil society organizations, and uh, other stakeholders. Uh, yun, uh, it will deliver greater impact. Tapos kasi uh, everyone has a role to play and with uh, if we have to change uh, the challenges brought by both climate and pandemic, then everyone has to do their share. Uh, specifically and most importantly, uh, environmental punishment and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Eric. Sir Ed, please. Key take uh, Yeah, we're establishing the uh, Eastern Desires Climate Change Network this year with funds coming from the climate change expenditure. And uh, whatever help you, you can provide us, particularly information that we can disseminate uh, among the LGUs in the whole uh, Eastern Desires will uh, be much appreciated. Lalo-lalo uh, na kay Dr. Faye, kailangan mo namin ng mga projections para ma-inform din yung ating mga LGUs uh, dito sa Eastern Desires. And I think really have to continue capacitating our locals. Uh, yung sinabi kanina ni Francis Yata is building local research teams. Uh, ito yung isa sa mga makakatulong din sa atin so that they can th themselves uh, produce or generate the science-based information that they themselves can use to really uh, uh, influence their local officials and decision makers. Mas madali ito kaysa sa atin na uh, outsiders. Uh, yun lang. Salamat. Thank you, Sir Ed. Ms. Majo? Okay, um, so since last year na nagsimula yung pandemic, people were saying na agriculture, aquaculture, uh, ito yung mga resilient sectors. Not sa pandemic, not because um, because kaya pa rin nilang, they were allowed to operate. They were part of the essential sectors. But the 2020 ended and we didn't see any growth. Industry and services declined. And the lesson there is, hindi naman kasi tayo nag-pour in ng investment sa kanila. So how can we expect that they can carry our economy if we did not actually pour investments into these sectors? So same thing with climate resilience, with our climate change change um, issues. Mukhang kailangan, wala well, tayong choice, but to continually um, ask for support, pa, pa, find resources, and convince people to pour in resources into the natural sec resources sector and the environmental sector. That's it for me. Thank you, Ms. Majo. And finally, um, Dr. Toby. I think that, um, you know, the, the pandemic has, has really opened up an opportunity um, for the country um, and for localities to rethink uh, the development paths that we were on. Um, it would be such a pity to just try to get back to where we were before because we already know that doesn't bring us to a point of resilience. Um, this is such an opportunity now to mainstream climate concerns. There's no better opportunity to do it now. And so um, because we, we've demonstrated, I mean, the pandemic has given us real life example of what happens when we don't think of um, uh, resilience in real terms, in real terms. So I, I, I think that um, uh, we have to pivot, right? We have to really start think, uh, talking or telling people that it would be foolish um, not to pivot, right? It would, it would make no sense. Um, and that includes not only the choice of development path, but also roles. Uh, that local uh, municipalities, provinces, and the national government play. Um, if we don't take advantage of this opportunity, um, I would, you know, I, I think it would be a real a tragedy. It would be a tragedy. Um, we were warned already about um, uh, this, about uh, emerging diseases. We didn't listen. We are now being warned. We have been warned. Um, about climate change, if we don't 
listen, hindi ko na alam. <laughs> so I, I think that we need to use the examples of the pandemic connected to resilience and, and, and use that. Um, don't forget this example in, in, in our advocacy for uh, mainstreaming climate action. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Toby. That's really inspiring. At nakaka-inspire itong hapon na to, you know, research, and it's really close to my heart, actually. And um, hearing um, inspiring words from all of the, our experts, really mas, ano, para mas nagbigay ng drive for us to, to really continue this, this, uh, this work, this action towards resilience. Sir Francis? Uh, well, yeah, thank you very much. And for those who, for those of our viewers who, uh, apparently we had viewers who cannot understand Filipino, I uh, just want to assure them that we'll, we'll have the recording subtitled uh, so that we can spread the word and, you know, uh, share the, the rich discussions that we had uh, this afternoon, for which I thank our panel of ex our panels, our, our, our experts, our guests here. Thank you very much for spending time with us. And, you know, uh, uh, is that we, we, we didn't have enough time, but uh, maybe that's a good sign <laughs> that we really had to continue this discussion. Yes. So, maraming yes. salamat po. Okay, um, so as our discussion today comes to an end, uh, thank you very much to our speakers, of course. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce now for our closing, Miss um, Lourdes TV. Um, she's presently a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts to the Climate Change Commission and also the Climate Science Advisor of ICSC. Um, having gained extensive experience as a researcher in climatology and climate, climate change science, she has been participating in the preparations of the global reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC as a lead author, expert, and government reviewer. So I would like to call on Ma'am Lourdes to inspire us uh, with her closing remarks. Ma'am Lourdes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. From the land down under, this afternoon has proved to be very interesting and very informative. Kailangan pa bang isara itong... <laughs> Itong discussions na to, I mean, like, this is just a formality. Uh, well, let me begin by thanking everyone who has made this webinar worth our time. Firstly, to our esteemed peers from the National Panel of Technical Arts, the Climate Change Commission, Dr. Lau and, and Dr. Ino, and we look forward to having Dr. Toby with us. I don't know what is keeping the Climate Change Commission from appointing her. We, I think she has been considered to be a member, to become a member of the NPT, but well, I don't want to preempt the Climate Change Commission, but this is happy news for me. I hope it materializes. Okay. Uh, I also want to thank our practitioners from the field in the academy. The knowledge and perspective you have shared today have enlightened us and have given us a glimpse of the significance of all the work that you have been doing. And it has given us a deeper understanding of the complex nature and extent of the impacts of climate change and of COVID-19. And how these will continue to be the gravest twin challenges of our time with their complexities and demands for the solution space. Most importantly to the members of our audience, our colleagues and friends out there who has joined us today, uh, who you have all enthusiastically spent the afternoon listening, sending questions and sharing comments. Thank you all. This episode and the entire series are for all of us. May we continue these conversations till the third episode and beyond. I remember the time when my children were small and they felt unwell. Immediately what I do is put my hands on their foreheads or their necks and 
to check their temperature. The next course of action would include using a thermometer if I have one, happen to have one, and checking for other symptoms like perhaps colds or cough and possibly a host of other manifestations. Now, if you fast forward this to the present time amid this pandemic, that despite previous warnings about pandemic going to happen and we never paid attention to them, checking for fevers, listing symptoms and providing medical histories among others have become not only common among households, but also a standard fare in our offices, restaurants and public establishments for trouble and for other reasons that would entail social distancing to curtail the spread of the virus. In the same token, we have seen symptoms of how febrile our planet has become. Slow and rough with onset events most often have become symptomatic of our warming climate. And we know now without any doubt, the planet is suffering from a fever that has not and will not let up and we do take urgent drastic actions. If only quarantine practices were but feasible for the earth's surface, the oceans and the ecosystems that we share. These two fevers, one viral, the other climatic, are now the two normals we have to contend with. Indeed, the health of our planet and human health are inextricably linked. Fortunately, an arsenal of tools that allow for research and the accompanying work in the field to build on and affirm what they already know. How this will all affect us further and the solution space to nurse our planet and our public health back to its healthy uh, state. This episode also gives us a glimpse of how effective practices building on research can help us address both the climate crisis and the pandemic. The experiences that are shared are critical and unraveling stories, especially in the ground, and adding to solutions that we can apply. The conversations focus on the complexity of climate trends in the Philippines reflecting challenges in our lands and the ocean and the marine environment, threatening the country's food security and the pursuit of sustainable development. The exchanges between the panelists also presented the innovation, acceleration and scaling up of climate adaptation efforts based on evidence, how people's livelihoods and health affected were affected rather, particularly for the most vulnerable, especially women and children. All testaments of what our creativity, our ingenuity and innovation in doing research and finding solutions can do. We acknowledge that the science of climate change and its associated complex and compound impacts are highly technical in nature. But through platforms such as this webinar, we allow ourselves to explore and communicate these concepts in conversation with the more diverse audience, connecting academic institutions and local government units, sharing perspectives on how to address both the climate crisis and the pandemic with experiences and stories on the ground. And while we have made strides in advocating science and research as fundamental guides, we still need to recognize that we need to into actionable and effective measures. Further, its indigenous knowledge and local practices should complement our scientific baselines, evidence and methodologies. We must note and highlight climate change is not only an environmental issue that needs environmental solutions, but more importantly, it is an extremely complex development concern. Indeed, there still are various challenges and unanswered questions to address. 
research, innovation, and outreach are part of the global solution space. Gaps and systemic challenges still exist, and they hinder the integration of the lessons and practices on the ground in the broader scientific literature, including effective strategies that champion local perspectives and innovations. Findings from scientific research and stories in the ground serve as our foundation for a better climate resilience and development. As we have heard in this webinar, the ground is fertile for more potential contributions from local experiences that we can elevate to regional and international arena of climate action. As the advisor of the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, please allow me now to bring this afternoon's episode to a conclusion and reminding everyone also that our conversation should continue. Let me also take this opportunity to invite you and everyone to the third and penultimate episode of this webinar series, which is going to take place on March 26 this year as part of the Institute's contribution to the Climate Adaptation Summit 2021 in partnership with the Netherlands Embassy. We look forward to your continuing participation. Magandang gabi po at maraming salamat and my best regards from where I am. Unfortunately, I would have wanted to go home, but I just can't unless I can walk and cross the oceans. I would have wanted to be back there a long time ago. International travel has become very difficult. You won't even allow us to, we can leave, but we can come back. And that would be a very, a, a something that I could not take at the moment because I need to be with family too. COVID has really become such a, such a baggage. So we should take note of what Dr. Toby has been saying that we need to, we need to consider uh, enhancing the resilience of our systems because pandemics may come and go. This is not going to be the last pandemic that will happen to us. And climate crisis is there. It is an existential uh, problem. We may not see human life before the end of the 21st century unless we do some drastic actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma'am Gerdes. I'm sure makikita tayo very soon and hopefully here, here in the uh, Philippines you'll be back. <laughs> I miss you. We miss you too, ma'am. Maraming salamat miss po. Miss you. Um, and, oh. Miss you. <laughs> and um, again, thank you to everyone who have joined us in this afternoon's webinar. Stay tuned for updates on the social media accounts of ICSC. Mm -hmm. um, via the facebook.com slash icsc.ngo and via twitter um, via twitter.com slash icsc underscore ph and the Netherlands Embassy at facebook.com slash nl in Philippines and twitter.com slash nl in Philippines you may also visit um, bit.ly slash um, cas 21 climate COVID-19 to learn more about our webinar series. Um, join us again on March 26 for the last episode of Climate Change and COVID-19, Adapting to Two New Normals, which will tackle climate finance and multi-stakeholder collaborations. Have a great day ahead and stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>